buttoned that up. <laughs> I'm very relaxed, as you can tell. I'm stretching. Brother, last time we had you on the show, we uh, we did a double with um, the member for Herbert or the mouthpiece himself, Philip Thompson. Uh, so you didn't get a fucking word in edgeways, mate. So with what's going on currently uh, in the space, uh, I thought we'd get you back on, mate, so we can actually figure out who the fuck Paul Warren is and, and what's going on, mate. So <laughs> thanks for coming back on, brother. No, thanks. I appreciate that. Um yeah, Tomo can talk, um, but he's he's got a story and he's he's got a platform where he can, you know, get his message out at the moment, which I think is great. Um, but I think you'll learn, you know, through this podcast, we sort of did our apprenticeship together once we left defence and and we know the ins and outs a little bit, you know. Yeah, fucking nice. Um, I just want to take because the problem is that we know each other so well that everyone else is like, who the fuck is Paul Warren? So. Mate, let's go through. You're not a stranger to fucking hard knocks, and especially being one of the older blokes that joined the army. Um, take us through your 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 inception into fucking hard knocks was kickboxing, right? Yeah, for sure. Yep. I think the difference with me and a lot of people is when we get to speak at these platforms, and I'll work backwards a little bit. Is the army didn't create me. I wasn't the 18, 19 year old digger um, that sort of had resilience and discipline and all this stuff bashed into them that way. Um, like you said, I was one of the older blokes when I joined. I was I was 27 when I joined. So and I shared a room at Kapuka with Keats, who was 19. He was he was a baby pretty much, but very mature. Like um, and yeah, proved me wrong in a, in a few ways when I, I tried to tell him such, but. Um, for me, yeah, I, I grew up in Toowoomba. Um, yeah, it was, it was a bit different. I, I lost my mum, I think, before I was 12 months old. Um, so those sort of things when you're growing up, you know, you, you kind of... I, I learned about death very early on, um, if that makes sense. Um, when you're a kid and you're sort of dealing with that sort of stuff. Um, Stepmum and dad, you know, brothers and sisters. Growing up in Toowoomba, it's, it's very much about sport. Um, and my dad was a good footy player, but I was just horrible at it. Absolutely horrible. Um, I like playing footy, and I did finally play A grade and stuff like that in Toowoomba. But as a kid, you know, my parents realised that wasn't for me. Maybe they were sick of getting embarrassed every weekend. I don't know. Um, and I got into karate, I think, at 9 or 10 years old. And this is, this is pre, you know... John claude Van Damme and, and, you know, all those eras where it all became sexy and everyone started going to Thailand. It was, you know, I'm showing my age a bit now. I'm 42, so. But I, I took to that. Um, I liked the lifestyle around it. It's six, seven days a week, you know, when you're really invested in martial arts. Um, I should have been paying attention to, you know, school results and stuff like that, and I wasn't. I'd, I'd work my way through Queensland and Australian teams, and I got picked to go to... Uh, Denmark it was as a 17 year old so when you grow up um, you so know for, with school no this is in an open sort of martial arts team so just weeks and, and sort of years of you know having resilience bashed into you I guess that's the thing about martial arts like you'll turn up and you know if you have a bad day on the footy fields and there's no disrespect or comparison but you know you'll, you'll drop the ball or things don't go smoothly you know, if you have a bad day in the gym, you'll, you'll go home with your tail between your legs. <laughs> like, you know, some days you're the hammer, some days you're the nail, and you don't get to pick what, which one sometimes. So, like, that's that's the nature of the beast. Um, but, yeah, I sort of worked my way through there, and I, I loved it. I just took to it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's about diet, and, you know, you're at it six, seven days a week just trying to be, you know, make a name for yourself or just, you know, compete at a high level, I think. Um and with that comes a lot of not only physical but emotional resilience. You don't get results you want, you know. Especially as a kid, you get to you get to learn that if you wanna you wanna win and you wanna be on the top spot, you need to earn it. You don't just get it given. Not everyone gets a participation award. Like that's that's part of where society's gone wrong. I think. Um, just my opinion. Um, so do you think do you, not having your mum and, and going through loss was that something that drove you to join the military like deep down like behind all the but prior to the combat sports or after the combat sports was there 
What was the driving force to join the military? Honestly, mate, it was the similarities between, I think, who I was and what I was doing. And the fact that when I decided to join, um, I'd had a 10-year Thai boxing career, um, which for most people, you're lucky, you know, you're very lucky to get a two or three year career. So I was pretty fortunate. I had some longevity in that sport. And at the start, I wasn't, I was, I was horrible. Like I, I had this overinflated ego when I got back from Denmark. I think I got fourth in the world against kids that were 17. But for me, I always wanted to chase a Thai boxing career. Like, I don't know, that was just what I wanted to do. Um, I jumped into my first fight at 17 um, with a massive ego not so much ability and a 30 year old bloke came out and punched the snot out of me like that was my introduction to to that sport like fuck who was your manager mate is that is that standard ethical? no hey <laughs> ethical you mean no. yeah is that ethical or have a 30 year old bloke jumping in a ring with a 17 year old or were you no, that... were you grading that well no that's that's just the difference in sports like I'd I'd been sort of you know, through karate, you know, as a 15, 16 year old started, for some reason, a lot of their competitions go on height. And I was just, you know, I was six foot tall. So if I'd sort of do all right in my age group, I'd, I'd be go up into the open men's and start fighting them as a teenager. Like, I was no prodigy or anything like that. But, but once you go into tie boxing where there's rounds and they don't stop the fight so much. It constantly flows and pretty much your weight's your weight. doesn't matter if you're 16, 30, you know, you, it, it's open slather. Um, and I think that that first thing, that first fight, like I had two black eyes, I was busted up, I couldn't get tired for a few days, but for some reason, there's that nutcase inside me goes, this is what I want to do, I need to get good at this. Um, and I've always sort of had that mentality, I think. Fuck, why? What is that? What is that internal? <laughs> I don't know. And when I get early onset dementia and all these good things that are coming for me, I'll be like, this is why, because you're stubborn and you just, you just, yeah, I don't know. Um, so from that first fight, started to cut weight properly. That's, a, that's an event and a discipline in itself sometimes. Um, I'd walk around about 84, 85 kilos and I could cut to 76, 78 in the last week. And your body just gets good at that. Um, somehow, it just once you do it often enough, your body knows when it's weight cut time. And it's a lot of it's just water weight and you, you weigh in the night before and you put it all back on. So um, that's, that's a test of who you are at times before you even get to the fight, I think. One of the hard ones I did, I, I had to cut to 75 and I probably didn't have too much food or water for two and a half, three days. So that just creates that discipline and mindset that you need like before you've even fought anyone. So um, yeah, little things like that definitely create who you are, I think, long term. Yeah, because who was, uh, we had Brownie, his podcast is going to drop out soon. Uh, he was talking about that weight cutting and, and that is almost that's half of the fucking battle or, or the test of a real fighter getting in and cutting weight it's like a pride thing like you won't miss weight as opposed to taking a drop in the in the like will they get fined if they don't make weight or yeah going back to when i was sort of fighting yeah you, you it's your reputation if you turn up and miss weight well promoters are not going to have you on it you'd rather you'd rather literally rather get knocked out than turn up a couple of, a couple of kilos overweight and so um that's just your reputation and you know you being professional really you turn up if you agree to a weight you turn up on or under that and and go from there um because is it up to so if if we were gonna have a fucking blue and i wouldn't recommend it because i'd fucking lose but would um and i rocked up overweight is it up to effectively can you call it or is it up to you to keep you're like no i'll fucking fight him anyway i don't give a shit yeah some of the best arguments and stuff come from the way and so you know, I've seen a guy um, down at the Gold Coast because, you know, my the scene I used to fight on was Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunny Coast, um, in around there. Um, I've seen a guy have to run off 200 grams because the other trainer's just like, no, nah, this is the weight, off you go. And he'd already, he's already dry and tired and your body just stops sweating after a while if you've cut too much weight. Um, 
And yeah, I've, I've literally seen someone run off 200 grams. So um, it depends how much you're going to be over and, and what, yeah. It just becomes a discretionary thing then, I think. But, you know, you normally send them to try and cut more because they're already drained and punished. You're just punishing them again, like, for not not doing what they should have done in the first place. <laughs> Mate, fuck that. I don't think I can go two seconds. I, I, water deprivation, it's got to have a lasting effect. Um yeah, I'm sure uh, it might. I'm I think sh- you just don't like cat and wait full stop, mate. <laughs> <laughs> might be genetic. I'm big boned, mate. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't that a thing? Just fight fucking super heavyweight. Don't they have no no max? That's what can. Oh, sorry. The, what's the um, super heavyweight? What's, what's the, the fucking category? Oh, you're looking at I'm 90. Pretending I, I'm pretending I know fighting. You're looking at 96 kilos and up. And through my oh, career. It's anything up, right? Yeah, anything up. Yeah. yeah it's, mate, that's you. Max, done. Yeah fucking into it that's um, definitely not me like through my career I was fortunate enough to spar with people like um, Nathan Corbett and there's never been a more apt fight name for a person than Carnage like he just tore people apart at 76 kilos 79 83 and he won world titles at all these weights until he was a heavyweight and was bashing them as well so sparring with him or I ended up having to get rooms down at the Gold Coast because I was pretty much concussed trying to drive home like so people like that kept me in my own weight and away from them so it was, yeah good lesson there so are you worried about the i mean obviously what was that pot what was that um uh netflix doco about the american nfl player uh, concussion the concussion and like they're talking about those symptoms for cte transferring over early onset dementia um and a lot of the signs for traumatic brain and TBI and, and repetitive blast injury replicate uh, PTSD, right? Are you worried like that you're going to get to fucking 45 and you're going to forget which end to fucking peel a banana? Or? Uh, it doesn't matter, mate. You can feel it both ends. <laughs> <laughs> Once I start in the, in the middle, I know, I'm, I've, I know I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> when you start eating the skin, you might be fucked. No, it's a fair question, though. And I did a lot of research when I got back from the GAN, like, um, and a lot of the American researchers and, you know, you got hospitals like Walter Reed that focus on amputees and stuff like that. But And the NFL spends bulk money on research, right? Like, because they don't want the bad PR coming from concussions and, and things like that. Um, yeah, a lot of the symptoms are, are the same. Um, if, if I said I hadn't had a bit of a look over my shoulder and done a bit of research, I'd probably be lying because yeah, I, I haven't been kind to my body through through this period. Um, and yeah, I've been knocked out cold in, in fights and with everything, punches, knees, kicks, elbows, like, um, yeah, I'd, yeah I, I don't know. It's, it's a bit of a bit of a guessing game still, I think, but, but hopefully I get to see my kids grow up still. Or remember your kids growing up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the long, the long and short. I mean, this is something we have to bring up with Charlie too, yeah, down the track, whether he not, knows about it or not. But the the information that I've read or seen, mostly pulling it from that, um, Gore was Doctor Gordon saying there is, you can check signs and symptoms. They can't prove that your brain's fucking deteriorating until they cut it in half, and there's no turning back once they cut it in half. Like they're only doing it once you're already dead. So, well, some of us use more or less of our brains than the other people, mate. I think I'd be all right. You cut half my brain off, I'd still be talking English. <laughs> <laughs> mate, the treatment's just uh, extra testosterone, so you might as well err on the side of caution and just start extra testosterone. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. Like, this conversation's come up with me a little bit lately, too, actually, because you get to a point, I'm 42 now, and I said my body's been through a bit, and that's before I even got blown up. Um, like it's not about beach muscles and all this stuff it's it's about quality of life like i do want to be out and active with my kids for as long as i can be and you know when people start talking about this and, and they're doing it in moderation and medically i'm not against it I, I can't be oh fuck no mate and the i mean the steroid argument the the debate in the western world it's the same as the argument against like weed or or, or most drugs that are fairly harmless it's there's a propaganda campaign that came out years ago and it's it's 
shape the way we think about it. Like, your body produces testosterone. Yes, Arnold Schwarzenegger and fucking bodybuilders are going to jam gear in their ass until they're ginormous. That's not the goal, but that's where all of steroids' reputations come from. Testosterone replacement. Anyone over 35, like I turned 35, I'm like, I'm going to start investigating this because the the fact of life is females go up in testosterone after 35, males go down. And you meet in the middle and then you get like old grumpy chicks with mustaches and, and weak kind of depressed and, and, and shriveled dudes. And like, oh, you made that's them right, just part yeah. of life. Like you can either accept it or you can use modern science and fight against it. And that's not... I, I want to start, like, I'm, I'm seriously going to look into it probably through this year. What's the the lowest dose testosterone I can get on to just stay 35 forever as far as testosterone levels go? Um, and, mate, if someone's got a problem with that, that's their problem. I'm going to go see an endocrinologist and, and get measured and, and see how we go. I think maintaining optimum levels is perfect. If 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 I was a diabetic because I'm not producing insulin, I'm, I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about die induced diabetes i'm talking about type which one type one is the bad one right it's like genetic type two if so if you're if you're not producing enough insulin the cure is they give you insulin like they give you extra what you're missing if you testosterone levels are dropping off the point of depression and you know physical breakdown top you back up to recommended levels like you said i'm not talking about jamming fucking needles in my ass and turning into a fucking fridge 100 percent. i mean the normal levels is, is still no one's measured it but there's healthy range for 18 and then as you get older and older it starts to drop man get me back to an 18 year old i'm happy yeah well the, the range the range is massive i looked into it the range is huge and you can be on the lower end and they won't treat you and the lower end is suboptimal like you don't want to be sitting down there 25 year old yeah. pumping out a test of a 50 year old man that's fucking bullshit so I went through this process a um, couple of years after I got back and I was already out of the army and my GP said, we'll send you to an endocrinologist. Um, I was working on Nauru then, so working shift work. Um, the range was 11 to 40. So that's, that's a big range depending on age and, and whatever. I was showing sixes and sevens. Mm. So, like the, the so you're a big giant of, woman walking around? Yeah, 60-year-old man, they, they were saying. So... Um, yeah, did it properly, went through an endocrinologist. Um, the funny thing was, as soon as I stopped shift work, um, the night shift stuff, it started to bounce up by itself as well. So um, that was, I thought that was interesting. You, you know, I, I didn't mind night shift, but clearly my body didn't like it. Mm. There were lack of, sleep. Yeah. that's how people are frauding um, tests, like testosterone tests. They just deprive themselves of sleep, go to the docs, get their measurement done, and then, oh, I'm really low free steroids we're not saying that's the cheat sheet people but <laughs> so but there's some things no. coming out that army so and this comes into a moral compass with so uh my argument i'm going to try and present it as best as possible um firing 84s and fucking anti-tank caliber we are shooting 84s that are the size the caliber and size of tanks from world war one and two an 84 millimeter Carl Gustav, an inch from the side of your head, is the largest. Ca- there was, I think, the the Tigers had 80 something millimeter guns in World War Two. That was on a tank. The repetitive blast impact of that. The army didn't know that. So the army's just saying, "Hey, look, we need to fucking win wars. Let's just give this. This is a recallless rifle. Let's, let's send it." Should they be accountable in the future for what they made people do in the past when they didn't know, right? And then is the same with sleep. So, okay, um, you're in the army. You've got to do picket for fucking 18 years of your life. You literally go out bush. The old boys used to go out bush six weeks at a time. They were doing, running on minimal sleep most of their life. As a byproduct of that, should the army be accountable for that? Or because they didn't actually, it's, it's not like malpractice. They just didn't know that those things was, were a problem. It's like the, the cancel culture in Hollywood. You can get canceled for something you did you said 15 years ago is it the same or should army that that's where i'm at you know what i mean they, i'd be interested in to hear some opinions who from everyone yeah oh, oh mate i'll ran on this all day how long have we got hey we got two hours no in the short version no there is no way mate in, in any topic you want to bring up any topic you want to bring up like this is it's, it's like a um 
every time someone talks about cancel culture or, or should, like this conversation, should Army be responsible for stuff that they didn't know they were doing back in the day, it, mate, the generational change, we, you're never going to keep up with it. And we've tried to pretend now as a society that you should be. You should be responsible for stuff that you did in the past, even though you didn't know in the past that it was wrong, but now you know, therefore you have to pay for it. It's like, fuck no. If they change the law tomorrow to say you're not allowed to wear um, T-shirts with fuck on them, does that mean that I need to go to jail for wearing a T-shirt with fuck on it last week? Fuck no. Like, it it just brings... uh, Every time we talk about this, it reminds me of um, the uh, Gran Torino movie with Clint Eastwood sitting on his front doorstep drinking tinnies and chewing jerky because he just gave up on the world because they, they became so... F- the world changes every generation and, like, we are becoming that generation that looks at the younger generation going, where the fuck is this going to go? Like, and, and if we let it keep running, everyone's going to jail. Everyone from our generation should be locked up because we have all done stuff that in 20 years' time is going to be illegal or is it someone's going to be offended by and it's all fucked up. The counter-argument, being offended, is one thing. Legislating around being offended is a whole other thing. Trying to pin stuff on defence forces, like we we have to be realistic. Everything multiplied by time gets really really funky. Hundred years from now, if it goes the way, the nice version of the future, we stop killing each other. We are then the next generation after you have no wars. The first generation that's never seen war is going to look back at war like we were fucking barbarians. The same way we look back at like the 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 romans when they just killed people for sport in the in an arena like we could never imagine that in our time but we're not that far from it so it's, it's like one you only need one gap generation and it's a slippery slope mate if we get to the point where there is no war and there's a whole generation gap then there's the next generation who never heard of anyone killing anyone it's not, the people who are still alive the grandpas of that generation that still used to bang it in a bit they're fucked mate because that, gener- that young generation who's never seen any hard anything uh, is going to think everything is dis- destructive. Like, mate, we, I mean, we're on, we're on a path to not being able to hunt animals anymore. We're on a path to, to not being able to eat meat. And then the next generation after that's going to say that you, you're not allowed to eat vegetables because they have feelings too. Uh, well, like, they do, apparently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so Hungry Jack's just brought out the Rebel Burger, didn't they? Which is the tastes like and this is the fucking funny i don't want i'll get back mate I'm, i've segued the fuck out of this but the rebel burger tastes like a big man uh tastes like a whopper but it's not a whopper so what's that telling you the whopper's probably fucking just as fake anyway but um yeah, mate. <laughs> in terms i can sort of bring it back a little bit in terms of what adrian just said so you you know social media and stuff like that that are prevalent these days um when i was i was fighting and fighting lot regularly it was probably you know early 2000s so you didn't have facebook as a platform and stuff like this like i i went i think after my queensland title win i went undefeated for three years defended it once before i even got a look in at an australian title like i sort of paid my dues there a little bit and now when you just spoke about generation change you'll get a bloke that's had three wins and four losses and he's like on facebook going where's my title shot like it's a, it's a bit of a generation of entitlement and, and what about me? And I get it, social media is a great platform for promoters and stuff like that to build, you know, fight brands and promotions and things like that. But yeah, we, we have changed a lot. I think if you were that outspoken back then, they just would have set you up with someone to, to close, your, close your mouth pretty much. That's just how it would have worked. Yeah, mate, it's, it's, it's all generation gap. And I think we're... we're not look saying poor us but we are the unfortunate generation that was around that were were developed mentally kind of we'd learned some life lessons and we learned some rules about things as the internet was getting created and then so we've seen both sides of the internet and now with the internet and technology ramping up so quickly um in the past it would have been like five generations before there was major shifts like every generation has their own changes but drastic like radical shifts in the way the world operates take a few generations whereas now with us mate our kids are going to see completely different worlds to what we grew up in and their kids are going to be flipped like technology is making everything happen a lot quicker um 
But at the same time, like to, to change anything, all you need to do is say fuck you to one generation and then the next one, just the McDonald's theory. Like if you get them young, change their mindset with a Happy Meal, by the time they're adults, they are on your team. Like I mean, you got to pull me back. I love going down rabbit holes. But we had this whole conversation. It's kind of connected with the whole is the conspiracy theory behind vaccines and them making people infertile, right? That is one of the more spoken about conspiracies at the moment. Everyone's getting vaccinated. It's Bill Gates and his mates. They want to reduce the population. They're doing it through a vaccine. Make everyone get it. Become infertile. I'll go through this real quick because I know you want to go and talk about some real stuff. But everyone's like, the whole world would hate him. The response is like, the world will only hate him for one generation. Because if everyone becomes infertile and a select group of people are the only ones having kids, their kids come from a lineage of people who never became infertile. Two generations from now, everyone on the planet is not a descendant of someone who became infertile or was killed off. Therefore, they write their own history books and don't give a fuck about everyone else. So it's, it's a one to two generation gap. That's obviously an extreme example, but everything, every cultural shift through history only takes one or two generations and then it's forgotten about, mate. If you're on the if you're on the losing side of it, like you are out of the history books. So in answer to your question, mate, if if defence didn't know about it, if they didn't know about it, then no, they should never be responsible in history. If they did and they covered it up, then fuck them. Um, but no, if, there's no way if they find out now that blowing a dropping mortars, blowing stuff up, shooting sixty sixes and eighty fours gives you brain damage. They should not be responsible for anyone who got it. Yes, I mean, if they can afford to help those people out 100%, but they shouldn't be held accountable. um, What's the word I'm looking for? Criminally, I guess. um, For any damage they did to people before they knew. Otherwise... Because it's the Agent Orange stuff as well, isn't it? Like, they pumped Agent Orange for everything, and they're like, oh, that's really bad, like cancer. People were still smoking. Doctors were prescribed. Like, no, smoking is the healthy choice. And then they're pumping Agent Orange through fucking trees and shit. I don't know. And they're like, fuck, I don't know. Well, we've got to sue someone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mate, the, the bigger question is the, the looking at it the other way, looking forward instead of backwards. Research is coming out, right? We know it's coming. Matter of time. We get research saying if you shoot guns, if you drop bombs, your brain's cooked. What do they do? Make you sign a waiver? Like, looking backwards... Yes, you can say, hey, maybe they didn't know, but now you do. What do you do going forward? How do you how do you pull 17-year-old kids up at school seminars going, hey, come and join the army? We'll give you some brain damage. <laughs> what, what the fuck is the plan? Who knows, mate? Yeah, I don't think I'd you be a get... good recruiting ad walking yeah. in on, on a prosthetic going, hey, kids, yeah. come and join the army. Like, <laughs> Oh, mate, it's, I probably still would have signed up. <laughs> Oh, fuck. Anyway, get us back on track, Max. Mate, I'll get you back. So, mate, we're talking to Simon Maloney, talking about you getting in a ring, and because um, I really want to go through the fighting piece and find out what Paul's about, because once we get into the fucking... I feel that, uh, you, you know, no one really understands your backstory, mate, but when they when they when we take you into um, the incident that defines you it's not and and then you're a big one that your injury doesn't define you but it's finding out the person that you are who you are because of of your background of what we've always spoke about the people that join the army um uh that come from fucking tough upbringings where they learn this resilience from how they become good soldiers and then how they fucking move forward with life and, and and refuse to lay down and die uh and and this come up with simon maloney on the podcast fucking last week he was talking he got he's a british sniper got shot in the neck uh and he said he was laying there and he was like he just got pissed off mate like male he said it was male pride um and then i tried to <laughs> just try to bait him into an argument about toxic masculinity but we'll try and do it again now but um he was like fuck no it was male pride that made him get back up and like i'm gonna i'm not laying down and dying i'm gonna fucking live um is I just want to is that what you're feeling getting in the fucking ring with a 30 year old dude or where does the resilience come from that you have fucking developed and shown is it forged is it a birthright what what is it no it's it's definitely not particularly not in a sport like that um 
I said you, you've got to have that mental capacity sometimes to even get to a fight. Like, oh, shit, I've got eight kilos to drop. All my mates are going to the movies, going to Hungry Jacks, probably not for the Rebel Whopper, all that sort of stuff. Like, do you know what I mean? You, you've got to have that discipline for a start. And then it's funny what you just said and talking about going into the army. Like, I walked into one AR and I've got I've got Warlord tattooed down my forearm because that was my fight name. The amount of shit I copped from Kapuka, from Singo, from like, oh, tough guy, eh? and I'm like, every time, like, fuck, here I go again, like. And half the time, when you tell the backstory behind it, even if it's like a full track or a snake pulling you up, they're like, oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, fuck <laughs> off, it. <laughs> off you go then. Like, I, I, got, I got given that name, like, one of the ring announcers sort of said it, and I just had this weird ability to, you know, in real tight fights that were pretty close and, and stuff like that to seem to just weather that storm and, and come out in the end early on. Um, later on, I kind of decided that wasn't the approach I wanted to do and I started knocking more people out, but um, trying to take less shots. But it, it's not a macho or bravado thing. And I think this is something that people outside martial arts don't understand. Like it, you definitely feel alive when you've got a crowd of a couple of thousand people and you know, they're, they're just looking at you and this other guy and this, you know, you get that tunnel vision. You, you're not sure how to, until you have five or six fights, you're not sure what sort of fighter you are. Do I, am I the person that needs to, to really make myself angry and get excited? Do I need to stay calm and, and not burn nervous energy, which I found worked best for me? Um, and just rely on all the work you've done beforehand, the Ks in your legs and all that sort of stuff and the hard sparring, being shark tanked. If you've done 20 rounds, like leading up and, you know, to a fight, training, sparring, and you've had fresh guys come in and at you every few rounds, like it's a, it's almost like an out-of-body experience. You know you're good to go after a couple of weeks of that. These are the little things, and it takes that, almost that macho bravado thing, especially when you start having a few fights and, and fight experience, guys. It's, it's technical. It's controlling your emotions. It's like, you know, you see that the first, second time has come out, and I was that too at one point you get punched in the face and your first response is to get angry or get upset and it doesn't do you any good because you'll blow your wad and you'll be done in a round or two you'll probably realize halfway through round one you haven't had a breath yet and you've just thrown all these haymakers looking like justin hodges trying to box looks like someone fell off a boat and was backstroking it's horrendous like it's all about controlling your emotions you know, you really get into that mindset of I, I want I want to make him do this and how am I going to set this up? And it's the technical battle that sort of, it's exciting. Like, you've got to wear a few shots to get into that, but um, that's the part that's really exciting. So when you get to a, a unit and a battalion and someone's like, well, you're a tough guy, you got this on you, like, I'll fight him. Like, no dramas, mate. <laughs> like, that's that's what, I've, what I do, what I've done. Like, I... I'm not bigger, badder than you, but I guarantee you I'm smarter than you and I'll finish you off. Yeah, that's got to be a thing, I guess, once once you uh, learn just to be comfortable fighting. Like, it's not... Because, I mean, it's still a thing for, for, for most people, and especially as society keeps moving forward, physical violence is, is on the outer and outer as we continue to move forward. People get punched in the mouth and they literally don't know what to do when, and or thinking about it. So I'm just trying to get in someone's shoes where they're like, Oh yeah, getting punched in the head was that's the first step, but learning to be calm and logical and play chess with a human being different story. Yeah, hundred percent. It it's calm and it's calculated when you had Paul Kale on the podcast. He speaks he speaks to it with very little emotion. It's just like, yep, yeah, I needed to go do this, do this, do this. It's a process. You train it, you know, so when you got guys, you know, trying to intimidate you and put fear in you in whatever scenario saying, Oh, I'll fight you or whatever that it doesn't exist in us anymore we've when you're an experienced fighter you're like well there's no it's not a threat level you're more excited about a contest to be fair like you're like all right and if i did just get hit my brain doesn't go oh shit it goes what i get hit with what was that what can i do where am i going to go where am i going to move my feet you just go into that when you've done it for so long like it's the, the macho bravado thing is, is out the window and you just start to, to take a contest for what it is. Fuck. You can be I, in a crowd of 2,000 people and, 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 
and hear silence. Y- your brain gets to that. You just have this weird tunnel vision. You learn to listen to one voice, which is the one coming out of your corner, and you, you operate that way. Yeah, I've noticed that, especially since COVID with the UFC. Um, I don't know whether I just don't understand fighting enough, or, or, or the, the way I look at the the, the fights Dana's put together. Um, he hasn't put any rampaging rage fucking brawlers in fights that I've seen anyway. Obviously, I haven't watched all of them. Now, and it kind of makes sense because when you've got no crowd and you've got no energy boosting up emotional fighters, like you need the only the only fighters that can go out there and perform in the current scenario with no crowd, no noise, are ones that aren't fighting off emotion. Like dudes, obviously, if you're fighting in the UFC, you're fucking pretty experienced anyway, but there's still some of the bigger boys are going out there just to fucking swing until someone dies and that there has been none of them um and you'd have to again might be looking into it too much but you'd have to assume that the the guys putting the fights together are like these if we put our brawler out there now they're not going to be able to perform because there's no fucking way they can build the emotion required like we need to put all tactical logical thinking fighters out there yeah for sure 100 percent. and there's different types of fighters and you, you you know there's people that that feed off that energy and You'd be nuts if you didn't when you sort of you, you get your name announced and people sort of know who you are. Like it, it is, yeah, it, it pats your ego nicely. Like you've got 2,000 people, you sort of enjoy that moment walking out into a, yeah, and then you jump over the ropes and you're like, oh shit, all right. Yeah, now mm, then you sort of yeah, focus in on, on the job at hand. But people like obviously Conor McGregor and they're, they're you know, it's hard to put them in, a, in an empty stadium. They, they're obviously people that feed off that emotion and, and like it. Mm. And he, I mean, the same deal. Like he, he hasn't performed as well. He's up against a fucking sick fighter. But um, again, I'm a, I'm a backseat driving fucking couch commentator, mate. When it comes to <laughs> fighting, but going, but going back quickly to what you were talking about with um, turning up with a with a warlord tattoo and, and fucking full tracks and, and sergeants and that trying to size you down. I, th- I think that there's two sides to that. One, yeah. Call, call out Paul Warren when he first gets to fucking Kapuka and you're probably going to have a bad day. But at the same time, I think the attitude from that comes from... There's, and we'll, I think we'll get back to this a little bit later on in this conversation when it gets spicy. There's two types of people who join the military, especially the army. There's two types. There's people who want to be high-performing and be fucking amazing at their job um, and, and go over and bang it in and, and do stuff that most people don't want to do. And there's the work for the Dole program. There's the people who aren't really sure yet what they want to do in life. They probably don't want to do fuck all, um, but they they just, like, I've heard if I join the army, I, I, it's a good life and I get paid. When you when you become, like, the full tracks and the guys that start to, to get promoted are, are more, well, use this, the more often than not the ones that wanted to be high performing and, and, and go well. Um, you get to the point where it's kind of cynical, but the whole world is, is told as you're growing up judge people or, or sorry don't judge people but assume everyone's a good guy assume everyone's a nice guy and then if they fuck you over then then accuse them of being a fuckwit whereas you join the military and you kind of o- eyes are open to the fact that it's, it's really should be done the other way around assume everyone's a fuckwit and then if they're a good bloke then they can come across the fence and i think that's where a lot of that comes from too it's it's not so, there is a bit of fuckwittery and, and ego involved in it too but i think by the time you get to see so many people coming through Kapuka or Singo or coming new to the battalion um, and they're like I'm going to assume these guys are all fucking idiots and then when they prove that they go alright then I'll then I'll fucking back them in and I mean obviously someone walks in with a warlord tattoo mate I, I don't like to think I'm a super fuck with but I probably was a little bit to some of the young blokes coming in you're probably going to make jokes about it and then <laughs> The, the fighter Paul Warren goes well here's the here's the story champ and you're like alright he doesn't need to say anything else he's in the good category I'm going to go and fucking haze the rest of them but, but that's that's I, I don't think that's a bad thing I think that's that's part of like what the army does what the military does to you it's, it makes you stop looking at everyone as good until they fuck you over and it makes you look at everyone as shit until they prove it otherwise which is kind of, oh, mate, I, I still operate like that you kind of have to yeah, reputation built on performance and, and, yeah, who you are, and those people stand out. Um, I'm, I'm not upset by it in any way. I guess if you're going to join the military and you're like, uh, after Kapuka and then and then Singo, I kind of, I kind of knew it was coming, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, no worries. Like like I said, I, I didn't have a, 
I was 27 more then. Um, I had worked my way up and had two Australian titles. Um, it's nothing like, you know, you get punched and kicked and stuff like that. But when you start fighting two full tie rules and people are hitting you with elbows, like the first time I got hit with one of them, A, I was cut and bleeding straight away. And B, I just went, what the fuck was that? I just held on to old mate and hoped I was on my feet. Like, you know, little things like that just once again breed resilience and you're like oh yeah that was it now i need to get better at that and do this thing but um for me that transition into military and i think it set me up i've transitioned a few times i think so this is probably why i'm okay at it or good at it or i know what drives me to be successful um i had two aussie belts i was fighting for another one and i kicked the guys uh right on his knee um and it put a put a fracture down my shin so um, in 2006 that was um, and that was the end of that career essentially um, I'd kind of I was never going to be a world champion I'm not claiming to be at that level like I, you know those guys like Corbett and Wayne Parr and I was fortunate to fight on their undercards and stuff but for me that that segued me into the military I kind of looked around Toowoomba and I was doing average jobs I'm like I don't want to be stuck here and do this like I've got a skill set where does this fit in now and I've really thought, you know, I looked at, you know, some documentaries and Discovery Channel and saw what the Yanks were doing in Iraq. And I'm like, that looks all right. I could fit in there. I can literally sort of join from there. Like, I was, yeah, at Kapuka in 2007, I think. So um, that's where I thought, I, A, I had to transition because I'd put 10 years into a career where it's five, six days a week. Um, lost a little bit of identity, but... I know I've got to set goals, and so for me, military was was somewhere I thought I'd fit. Hundred percent. Yeah, I, I, because I just think it's interesting that that process of people, how you received, and the dynamic uh, of of a guy coming in. So there's corporals. So. I, Coming back to being a role player, I think everybody, human beings, a role player. I don't think anybody knows what they're doing. They just pretend they know what they're doing, um, and then they get the experience afterwards, right? So, mums, I think we probably spoke about this before. You know, mums before childbirth are like, I don't know, they have a kid, they just pretend to be a mum, right? They don't know what they do. Same with dads, they're like, you kind of learn off your, you know, your past experience, but you just you make it up until you are dad. You get corporals and sergeants who are probably role-playing uh, harder roles than they needed to coming out of a 1980s training army. No one had deployed. Vietnam, they were probably hard men that would have been like, cool, you're a fighter. Um, I was shooting fucking Charlie off the wire at, at 19. So they were probably hard men, right? They were probably just as fearless in that regard as you were. And then progressively over the generations that just transitioned into being well this is how i'm supposed to be i'm supposed to intimidate and this is what leadership is i just got to intimidate the, the the new guys i'm a i'm a young corporal i've got zero life experience um and now i've got to get eight dudes to do what i tell them to do i've got to be the big dick how am i going to do that i'll be a bully oh god there's a guy with a warlord tattoo let's fucking smoke him oh shit australian kickboxing champion um <laughs> hey mate oh, yeah. and oh, I, I think we got a good fair share of people made stories up about afghan for us and our trip and the boys after us that made our job as leadership a lot easier because of like oh they're afghan vets like they know what they're doing they made stories up in their heads and and everything's always hollywoodized as to what happened and so learning to actually use proper leadership in a situation was probably a little bit easier for us you know what i mean maybe yeah i 100 percent get what you're saying and it's it's a fine line you know like you you turn up at kapuka and they try and do that you know shock of capture thing you get there at night and uh to be fair like a lot of the staff that are, you know walking up and down the hallways and yelling at you and just just trying to confuse you and stuff like that a 27 year old brain doesn't work like a the 18 19 year old brain i think we were there about two minutes and one bloke's like, this is not for me. See you later. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> like, we're probably in a... We've chosen, we've chosen accountability. We have chosen to be part of a, a job or a team or a unit 
that's potentially going to be blown up and shot at. So I commend you, mate. If 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 someone yelling in your face and is your limit, well, yeah, don't waste anyone else's time. And the staff did a good job there by eliminating. Why why would you spend any more money training a person for that outcome that couldn't handle that? Like, good luck to him. I, I hope he found his place. Like, it, this is not a judgmental thing either, but. The staff have, a, a, I think, an accountability to... It's such a fine line. You don't want to bully people, but oh, you kind of need to start breaking people down. And I, I definitely respect that. And and I, I did get along with a lot of the staff, I think, because I was one of the older blokes. Um, yeah, first night, like, yeah, tough guy, warlord, all this stuff. And one of the one of the full track series, like, well, would you like to fight me, champ? And I said, oh, if the money was right. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> wrong answer, pal. I'm like, well... Oh. Right, I'll just I'll just pick up my socks and be on my way. Like no dramas. Like, but yeah, I get that the staff has has got an accountability to. I'm not saying bully or or, or shock people, but that bloke was just a, a good reminder for me. I'm like, mate, if you, you know, a lot of, I don't think a lot of you people, the people around me at that time, realised how lucky that we were. Like, you're almost getting paid to be a professional athlete if you go into a combat corps. You get up, you get fed. And they're going to pay you to train. Like I used to have to do that stuff before going to a shitty job. <laughs> like that's that's the way my brain rationalised it. I'm like, this is like a training day. Like awesome. I'm learning new stuff. I'm I'm happy. Yeah, I think that that contextualise being able to contextualise exactly what is going. I think it's car structures, man. I think in the future we're going to end up in car structures where they're like, okay. Let's not let the fucking knuckle dragon fucking Neanderthals play with the worker ants. Like, you're going to have warrior ants, you're going to have worker ants, you're going to have blue collar, and they are not going to... And they're like, hey, look, let's just figure this shit out. Warriors, they don't... They learn some skills and they, they get some... They develop some emotional and intellectual traits when they go overseas and they see things. That is not bad, negative, or neutral. That is just what happens within that cast. Um, and people are better suited to that then there are some intellectual motherfuckers out there who just don't develop. Oh no, there's some soft emotional dudes that, that probably don't do well stabbing people in the eyeball with a bayonet, right? Where, and, 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 and that's what I think that's where it's going, bro. I think honestly, caste systems in society. I think it has to, mate. Like the Divergent movie is the best predictor of the future I think there can be. That's, I mean, this is the first one insurgent diversion whatever the fuck it was called where you've got some people are good at farming that's good i mean we we, we kind of have that already um not subconsciously the wrong is the wrong word. we have that class or caste structure without without talking about it but it's going to become more defined i think we're going to, as we evolve like the next stage of evolution is people are going to some people are going to start becoming really good at some shit like i was talking to a few people i talk about this all the time but as the, the concept of even um, autism being the next step in, in evolution as far as people who are focused, less emotional, more focused on one or two things that they're amazingly good at but not real good at anything else because humans at the moment are just super generalist. Like we're a little bit okay at everything. We're still a bit emotional. We're still a little bit logical. And then some people just excel at one or two things and then they, that's good but they're still okay at the rest of them. But I think moving forward, we're going to evolve into something that some people like those those group over there are fucking wicked fighters make those like ants like make them your soldiers those ones over there are really good at gardening so make them your gardeners those ones that still got the emotional piece but could not fucking play tetris to save their life there's no logic in their brain it's just emotion there's a role for that 100 percent. that's not a negative but at the moment we're in we're in that like gray area in history where it's like no everybody's the same we're all equal make everybody gray literally gray like merge all the colors together merge fucking everything together it's like nah that's not fun for anyone i think nah. we'll go there no nah, it's 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 not feasible either like i think um with my role now you go and speak to engineers and you know some really intelligent people work in defense industry as engineers like i'm if you think you've got the whole skill set like i i know i don't belong there after a quick conversation with them like they're nice guys but they're just they're speaking about all this stuff with the new vehicles and I'm just like, oh yeah, cool. So they go forward and they do this. Like, <laughs> you know, if you think you've got that whole skill set, you are, you're, you're kidding yourself a little bit. Um, and I think when you come through like I did, 
the one thing you probably realise is is to have that humility a little bit. You're not the biggest, baddest dog in the yard, and and if you've had a a ten year fight career, you find that out pretty quickly. Like there's plenty of people that could have, you know, eaten me for breakfast. So you, you have that that humility and that hunger just to learn and be better. I think that drives that as well. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Because it's it's like I just feel that it's what people do more of when they're kids, when they're growing and developing that that, that sort of allows them to progress. So some people are gifted fucking football players. Like my cousin. Uh, sorry, my nephew Rowan, fucking retarded at school. He's a typical boy, but you put anything in his fucking hand—a ball, a fucking bat—he is a Jedi, mate, genius. And that's because he's what he's always done, right? And and you see people who train when they're kids and they start going to the gym and they do like excessive amounts of upper body workouts as opposed to lower, but they seem to be better at it. So one of the boys over west was a state sprinter. He just never seemed to get lactic acid build up when he went and did selection training. He was a fucking freak. And and so these particular people that, that, that grow when they're doing it, I think it's exacerbated. I think um, what you do when you're younger allows that benefit. And you, you've got 60 years to be good at something. You've got 40 years where you can actually value add to society. Um, and to build into that and to be an absolute expert in your particular field, you've got 40 years to provide something to society. That's it. So, what, 20 to twenty to 60, you're done. Probably less than that, hey? 20 to 50, if it's physicality, 30 years. If it's physicality. I mean, that's that's a caveat, right? So, if it, humans are moving to the point where, or revolving to the point where brains are going to be worth more than brawn. They already are, let's be honest. You're good at building computers, you're probably going to make more money than the dude who fucking lays bricks, unless you own the bricklaying company. But, like, that 100%, like, uh, when you're young, you, you've got a certain amount of years of, to provide value. But, yeah, I think brains will, brains will start to become um, good, hopefully. Elon Musk pulls his finger out, will be good into our 80s, 90s, 160s, all still be good to go. But going back to what was was saying, look, you, you turn up at Kapuka and there's some people that pull out on the first day um, and they realise it's not for them. Like, that is the reason why a cast kind of model will uh, works or, or why we used to have that kind of model and we're not allowed to anymore and why it's, everything's getting all fucked up. Like, people... The argument is that, that you take people through training and you try and weed them out. That is the point. So that you get the end finished product is an army full of people or a defense force full of people that are good at their job. All the ones that we, we, we had these barriers in place. We do X, Y, Z through training so that the people who don't like it, people who aren't good at it, people who are going to crumble in fucking combat are weeded out. And now we're, we're kind of removing that because you can't. You've got to be open and diverse for everyone. And in reality, it's because you've got to get recruiting numbers up and you've got to get people through the gates. So you just get rid of all the barriers and you fucking put gender um, or, or sorry diversity targets in or quotas in and you just pump everyone through. And that ticks that box. Like, cool, we're, we're, we look good. We're a 2021 model army. Everyone's happy. Everyone's loved and hugged and whatever. There's no hard stuff going through training. And then you fucking get out and you're like, why is everyone blowing up at DVA and everyone's fucking got broken brains? It's like, because they shouldn't have been there in the first place. And like, I'm, I'm going to go off a little tangent and I know we'll probably come back to this but I thought if, if someone's going to sink Swiss 8 it might as well be me right so <laughs> <laughs> there's I listened to our fucking mate give a big rant for two hours last night down in Canberra and 99.999% of the shit that comes out of his mouth is out of, out of trash um, so there's a little gem here and there but normally it's stolen from someone else's organisation that's why it sounds really good um, one of the things he brought up was Everybody, if you do, he's a big fan of the idea. If you do a day in the military, you're a veteran, you're in fucking title or everything, because you wanted to sign that dotted line. I'm like, that is great in a fucking bubble wrapped hug, hugs and kisses world. The reality is, if you've got a group of people, if you have a system where you get off the bus at Kapuga and from the first minute, the job of those instructors is to weed out the people who should never be there because their brains are going to break down the track. And they're doing that successfully. But that person, because they signed the dotted line and did a minute on the bus, they are now a veteran. That means DVA is responsible for all the people who fucking sign up to join the military who never should have been there. And that's a fucking problem. 
because they are the people who are getting weeded out because recruiters in their limited train uh, sorry um instructors in their limited training to to be able to identify the people that are going to be psychologically broken weed them out but we're still saying go to dva and fucking get 400 grand and a gold car for the rest of your life because you did a day at kapuka i'm sorry that does not fucking sit well with me when we've got a dude on the podcast right now got blown up overseas we've got guys that are fucking gunfighters doing stuff overseas that is why DVA was put there, to help those fucking people join the army. I mean, no, you don't have to fucking go to war for DVA to be able to help you out. That is not the. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is doing a day in the army, was that the answer to fucking give everybody the, the fucking pin on their, um, on, on their fucking chest to go, I'm a veteran now? I disagree. And I disagree because it's fucking causing more problems than it's, than it's solving. The only, it's solving one problem. It's silencing people who fucking want to whinge about the fact that the old legislation didn't call them a veteran. And that's one problem that got solved. And the problems it created was DVA is now flooded with 600,000 fucking veterans that a, a large percentage of, well, I haven't got the numbers, but a percentage of those people never left Kapuka. Another bigger percentage never left Singo or their fucking IET training. Yet DVA is now responsible and I would love to. I mean, I can only I can only fucking voice an opinion, but I would love to see the stats on the backlog that's clogging DVA right now. How many of those people have done more than a year in the military? It's fucking gross, mate. Because the the rumours or the the reports coming out of battalions are that dudes that just got off the bus from Singo heard you could get forty grand for fucking hearing loss, and they all just pumped it through. I'm like, how the fuck are you deaf, cunt? You've been in the army for fucking twenty minutes. You probably are, because you, you, you get deaf pretty quick. But you should not be clogging DVA system with people who have done one day in the army or one day in the military. Maybe there should be a, a whole other organisation or department that looks after those people. That is a whole other argument. Leaving people I think, re- fucking- I, I think absolutely, mate. You get rid- so Department Veteran Affairs is warlike or operational service, and then you have another department. And you work, go, work ex service, com- the ex service organization. Yeah, but it just becomes a workers' compensation thing. If you're a Kapuka and fucking fall or something, break your neck, of course you're entitled to insurance. It's just like everyone is. But yeah, I, I, that's the same. I haven't been overseas. I Defense, like workers' compensation, and Department of Veteran Affairs. Yeah, 100%. And that way, people can't weaponize the veteran word, right? So everyone likes to throw around the veteran as a political football. Veterans are killing themselves. No. Okay, well, let's define what a veteran is. Let's really figure out who's killing themselves. Uh, and then let's weaponize this 400 veterans are killing themselves. I'm like, nah, probably not 400 a year. Um, not from fucking overseas war fighters, mate. I, I looked at all the studies. Serving members. You know what I mean? Like Using the word veteran to encompass everybody has made this big, gray, fucking muddy area where nobody knows how to go forward. And it's just like being gay, black, or both. You can't talk about solutions in that area if you're not a veteran you can't have an opinion if you're not black you can't have an opinion on black problems if you're not fucking gay you can't have an opinion on gay problems this is the thing where we're playing identity stuff where if you're not a veteran you can't have opinions on it so now everyone uh, you well, it's know lived, like, I think it's, it's lived experience we, we don't value lived experience and what what Sada said before what so you got a, a person that maybe have done one day, went straight down to Digger James or got out of there at Kapuka. So never never really saw the real army. We know that's not the real army, right? Like it's a, a training establishment. So we, we haven't even approached the actual problem, which is, you mentioned it, is recruiting. We're recruiting the wrong people. Like just, you know, some of the people I've seen come through for a combat role, I'm like, yeah, sorry. Like you're obviously just a number or a statistic. But then because of that one day and we failed to to look at that actual problem dva has got to carry that person for a pension for the for the rest of their life like it's crazy it's yeah i think there's that because there's no link between dva and defense so defense don't give a shit right defense are like i need fucking numbers and we know that we know the transition authority joint transition authority is going to bridge that gap prior to that it was defense was like i don't give a fuck we need numbers right and they weren't talking at dva and dva is like why the fuck are all these people putting in claims and 400,000, like we, we're hemorrhaging dudes. People at DBA are quitting at record numbers because veterans, 
per se, right, which pisses me off in another sense, is that why do specific cores... When you're at, at 2 Commando uh, and you want to be all-encompassing, I guarantee he was not uh, encouraging of uh, a community-based system where his support staff and his, his non-combat... Who are you talking about? Heston Russell at fucking 2 Commando wants to talk about we're all one voice. I guarantee if a cook came up to him during his trip and had some valuable input to add on his mission or he was like, no, you're a fucking pogue. Don't fucking talk to me. But now he gets out. He's politicized because he gets more votes because he's an influencer. And that is purely what it is. I don't understand why when you're in the army, everyone is like, no, this is my call. This is who I am. This is what I joined. And then we get out. We're like, no, no, everyone gets along. Everyone should get along. We're all veterans. Mate, it's the it's the exact same reason why the Greens want to lower the voting age to sixteen. If the Greens want to solve the world world fucking environmental problems, you talk to people with jobs, houses, mortgages, cars, families, polluters, right? Sixteen year olds aren't creating a great deal of fucking world level pollution. So you want to change stuff in in the world space. You 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 want to impact. Um, People over 18. Let's just start that as a baseline because they're the ones that run factories and fucking big industry. So they're the ones that they're lobbying against. They start off with these great ideas going, let's lobby against these fucking factories and that, that are causing all these problems. And then they're like, well, hang on a minute. Now we need to actually get voted in before we can do anything. Who's, who's our actual fan base? It's uni students, high school students and children. So they're like, all right, what do we do? Let's fucking broaden the, the demographic of people that can love me. It's the exact same model. It's like, I give a fuck about one thing and one thing only originally, and that is solving environmental problems. So it's, it's me fighting against fucking whatever. And then it's like, no, hang on a minute. First, I've got to get my big fan base. And, and in order to be heard, I need a massive, massive fan base. So now I'm going to open the, I'm going to move the goalposts. The left and right of arc are getting way, way wider. And that is, the dude was working for us. And he had his, I'm not going to go into his views. He had a very strict fucking set of views and, and who he wanted to work with and the way he wanted to present what he was going to do. And that was one thing. And then the minute he needed to fucking run an idea to get into politics, it was, all right, I need everyone to love me. And the best way to get the veteran community at the moment, unfortunately, if you want the veteran community to love you, make them hate DVA. And fucking tell them that the, yeah, if you want to solve everything, it's a fucking DVA's problem. You don't have to do anything yourself. Fuck the government. They have to fix everything. It's all on them. And let's broaden the fucking brackets of who, who a veteran is and, and, and who can be my fucking fan or follower base. Let's broaden it right out and then I'm good to go. And again, like that is a fucking short-sighted solution because that is a solution to getting you followers. Broadening the bracket makes the whole fucking block we went through before makes the whole problem more complex. There's more fucking um, people with more d different needs, different backgrounds, different stories. So what is the end state? Is the end state to solve problems for, for dudes who have gone overseas and got fucking dramas from it? Or is the end state to get elected and then fuck the problem because it's been here forever, it's not going away? Like I, I know where, where what I believe is going on at the moment. And, mate, I listened to... um, Sorry, I know we've got Wazza on to talk about Wazza, but I'm fucking going in a rabbit hole here. I listened to Unforgiven 60 the other day with Jackie Lambie. And and I honestly, mate, I, there, was a, there was a time that I, I had a lot of fucking... Um, not not hate, but I didn't have a lot of time for Jackie Lambie before because the stuff she's done and said and running the same narrative of getting fucked DVA, knowing for a fact that she can never be, as an independent, can never be responsible for DVA. So fuck them, it's their fault. They've got all the problems. I'll never have to fix it, so don't worry about it. So you make everyone hateful and angry and you divide people and you make them grumpy and that's the problem with the world today. But that's what she did with the veteran community. That's all I thought. And then I listened to her on Unforgiven 60 and they did a fucking wicked job of stepping back like we we know where their views may have laid before the podcast they just step back and ask questions and some shit i'm not gonna lie a lot of um the ranting the fucking emotion and the the, the hate in lambie was still there and it still made me a bit sick but there was parts of her life story that i'm like oh, fuck i get it like i can see where she became who she is um and and a lot of what she's doing is driven by a want to change things just doesn't have a roadmap to fucking make any changes and maybe got lost along the way and, and got into politics and realised the political game was about staying relevant and staying in the conversation more than it was about solving problems. But um, 
fuck, I've gone down a rabbit hole now. I forgot where I was going. Um, but that's that seems to be the problem in this space at the moment. The, the people who we're putting on fucking pedestals in front of TV cameras are doing it for the fact that they get to keep being in front of cameras. They're not doing it for the fact that they want to solve problems because no. there is no logical answer coming out of anyone's mouth that's going to solve a fucking problem other than what Open Arms is already doing. Yeah, it's definitely fucking... an agenda. Yeah. Good, get back in the convo, fucking Mozart, and I'll <laughs> shut up. No, there's definitely an agenda with a lot of people that get involved in the space. And I'll, I'll be honest, my issue with Jackie Lambie was you've, without consulting us and who we are and what we need, you need to collaborate with families of people um, that have had issues, had dramas, um, and, and work those two voices together. You can't just go, a family person that hasn't served can't be the, the, the figurehead or the... Um, and as a parent, I'd, I'd hate to think what it's like to lose a child. Like, don't get me wrong, and, and this has happened. But you need to work those voices together. You can't have families going off on tangents that aren't what we need or, or we're pro- we'll provide solutions. This is why everyone's so against the Royal Commission. Just ask us and we'll tell you. But the broadening of the veteran term, I'm sitting in Coco's house, like, because my house is a bit of a shit fight at the moment. The people like us with complex needs, like I rely on this leg to get me to work, to pick up my kids, to do all this stuff. The broadening of that veteran um, term or the, or the, the base with DVA has pushed our complex needs almost more to the back of the bus. So you ring DBA and they're like, what do you mean? Like, you know, there's not a lot oh, of... I don't have I don't have a fucking leg. Oh. Been... Yeah. I, I don't throw too much shade on them, to be honest. I'm just like... Um, and this came from working with, you know, Philip Thompson for years. Like, we came to a point, I think, as probably drunk on one of the first Invictus games, actually, where you, you can be the... You can sit outside throwing stones at DVA or get inside the tent, make your voice heard and try and make it change so that people that go into combat in the next 10, 20 years aren't, you know, pushing the same stones we were trying to get, you know, a prosthetic or or something sorted that you need to live by. Like, that's the sort of attitude I think we adopted a long time ago and it's obviously doing Tomo pretty well. Like, the PM's listening to him and, and more people should be. There's only a finite budget, mate, right? At the end of the day, you're an implement of war, right? As fucking gay as that sounds, we joined the army for our own little snowflake reasons. Ah, you know, my mum didn't love me. My dad didn't keep paying me enough attention. I don't have any friends. I got my head kicked in. I'm brain damaged. I want to prove myself. I'm a man. I'm I'm full of... How many reasons have you got, mate? (laughs) Well, whatever it is, I'm talking about a a vast... Like, there's a demographic of people that join the army. There's no such thing as altruistic behavior. I tick most of those boxes, actually. (laughs) (laughs) You got got me eight out of ten. Yeah. (laughs) So there's no real altruistic behavior. I I fucking... I'm I'm, I'm not becoming cynical, but I, I, I think there are people who try to fix things because they have... They're empathetic. Um, But I think... And which which comes across as pretty good, but but deep down, people are still psychological egotism is is the driver. Unfortunately, we were fucking weapons of war, mate. Uh, you're a tool. You're literally a cog in a fucking machine, and you go to war. Something fucking happens, and and we're the only fucking country on the planet that looks after people. And now we get back, and they're like. No, no, you have to look after me. No, they don't fucking even have to look after you. The no, Roman, other country's doing it. So, do you know where the term vet, the veterinarian come from? Here's a fucking little, here's a fact for veterinarians. Where for old busted veterans from the Roman army that couldn't do shit anymore. And they went, you can go and look after the horses and the animals. Right? You can be, you can, you can continue your service as a veterinarian. Right? And look after the, the fucking livestock. I'm pretty sure, mate. Keggs. <laughs> you Go- better be 100% Google sure, it. mate, because it's fantastic. I'm telling you, mate. So they, they had employment, but that was it. They're like, cool. And, and the, the Romans, they did a, they did a reform uh, down the track where they said, hey, look, if you do 25 years in the Roman army, we'll give you a house and a land plot. There you go. Go fucking bananas. I just... Yeah, I'm just getting... We'll come a, back while, while Keggs... It sounds like DVA, owe me a horse. 
but literally this this came up the other day I was having a conversation with with D actually we were talking about DVA stuff and the big word from the space that's missing is accountability um, I chose to do this job I chose to be deployed I willingly went out on patrol that day I as a man need to accept the consequences like yep I lost a leg but but I'm, I'm still here like accountability is, is the the big word that's really sort of missing from the whole piece I think um, and we when we talk about DVA what about the bloke that does 20 years as a concreter 20 years as a brickie what, he, he doesn't get fuck all what benefits does he get there's no DVA for him his back's just as bad as ours his body's just as twisted up and messed up like we should be we should be thankful like yeah there's, there's got to be streams and pathways that we can help DVA fix some solutions with lived experience and some quality you know knowledge and you know like Sut said before the heap of guys turning up to to a battalion and they're all putting in tinnitus claims because they heard someone got a payment well you need to you need to bring your system into the 21st century and just be like all right have a streamlined computerized system such and such busted his ankle on this day it's all logged professionally and then that goes to dva like and that's your file not stories about oh yeah i was at this event one day you know we all know there was people not really there that are, are taking the piss a little bit as well there's some real simple solutions for a lot of this stuff but i can never throw shade at dva and, and like I was, I was saying what what about blokes that have just you know busted themselves out for jobs they chose like we did their professions yeah there, there's no there's no organization that helps them out when they're busted there's workers comp if they hurt themselves at work they'll get workers comp other than yeah. that yeah, that's it. you've got fucking old man back Deal because this it. is what society fucking loves veterans they fucking do mate and I'm so proud of it mate Australia America they fucking love veterans they see a soldier but they still look at a, a and I'm t- cause were less than relevant in World War 2 right because there was fucking German bombers battleships and fucking things they were like wherever you were on the planet there was a pretty good chance you were going to get blown the fuck up mate right I get that calls were not as relevant so everyone's a veteran old 60 year old I know I know, like I know it's different and I'm not trying to be a dick yeah you put your hand up and you and you serve your country and that is fucking fantastic but getting involved in in fucking combat where you there's 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 a finite end state to what's going to happen and those guys coming back I I, I don't know no, you keep running, mate. Keep running. You're pulling yourself <laughs> up. You don't want to get in trouble, mate. No, I'll I've get what you're saying. There, there has to be... I mean, the, the, the issue is what I think that we're facing. There's a few. One, there is no accountability. What was is going down the track? We don't encourage people to take ownership of their own fucking lives. We're like, we, we've built a model in Australia where it's... If you've got a problem, it's a government's problem. We've got a massive... We're over-governed, obviously. Um, but the other one is, yeah, we've opened, we've opened the... The, the, we've moved the goalposts we've opened the fucking thing, funnel and we've let people in and now we've got it's a system that is it's an insurance company that's managed by a politician who unfortunately has to work it as a spreadsheet you've got 600,000 people 500,000 of them are whinging at me because they want me to solve their entire lives problems 100,000 have been in gunfights and there's a few of them that have got fucking real bad injuries but they're I'm going to play the numbers game and I'm going to go for the 500,000 whingers and solve their shit and their shit is they just want badges money and fucking who who knows what else tomorrow it'll be something else well, they'll, they'll probably want a purple heart or something eh we won't get into that one next <laughs> <laughs> but and then I've got this 100,000 people this 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 20 percent or, or fucking just over or under whatever percentage it is I don't know at the moment but um that that were completed their four years did xyz had some issues the problem, I mean, and this is this is fuck saying it to you, was is that the problem is there's not enough blokes with one leg, because there's gonna we're gonna come to a time where some fucking politician or, or someone's gonna run a spreadsheet and go, these dudes over here, Coco was a um fucking I, there's a couple there's a, you could probably count them on fucking two hands, the blokes that I can remember that have got proper fucking injuries, it's not enough of them doesn't matter if I lose their votes because I've got 500,000 people over here that did a day at Kapuka 
they've they've passed the test we tick the box and they are whinging and they are fucking emailing voice of a veteran and they are calling jackie lambie saying the government's taking too long to process my claims and that is who's going to get this attention because that's the fucking squeaky wheel and unfortunately like the perfect world yes i heard people in yesterday's seminar go we need to put more money to it we need to put more attention to it fucking oath that is a short answer to a short-sighted problem where's that money coming from we've got to pull it from somewhere else you pull it from Rose, you pull it from defense, then we're going to blow up next week going, oh, there's not enough, there's too many potholes, there's not enough fucking tanks, no one's getting body armor. Like the, com- the complex fucking, the way the budget's built down, and this is a money thing, right? It's a fucking, no matter, it's, it's not hugs and kisses in parliament, it is a budget. Politicians are elected to decide when and how to spend our money. That is fucking it. That is Western democracy. And if we want to pull more money and give it to veterans, then fucking aged care is going to suffer. Someone else is going to suffer. I mean, you get where I'm going. Like, I, I would love to say I am. It's all identity, mate. It's all identity politics. I'm a veteran. I'd love to pull all the fucking money from gender studies. No one's allowed to sign up to go to the uni to go to gender studies anymore. Because fuck it, put the money into veterans affairs. Good fucking luck getting that one on, off off social media. No one's getting elected as the education minister ever again. Like. There is no way to... Once we've developed the welfare system and we've given people... Australia has the gold standard of veteran care. I mean, you listen to Maloney. Go and listen to the podcast from last week with Mo. He got shot in the fucking throat. The only way he could afford to buy a house was to sell his medal of gallantry. Because there's no fucking DVA system in the UK going, hey, 400 grand in a gold card. Of course you can, mate. You got it fucking shot in the throat. No, to buy a house, he had to sell his medal of gallantry. There's obviously more to it, but like we have the gold standard of veteran care in Australia. But because we've developed, we've set the bar so high, we've developed a welfare model where we give, give, give. We don't ask a lot in return. It's not enough. People want more. And then they're like, all right, well, let's give them more. Let's solve this fucking problem by giving them more. No. And I mean, everyone's got their own solution to solve world problems, but I think was is right. The only way to solve the current problem in the veteran space is to demand accountability from individuals to go we're not the budget's there what you get is what you get that's fine we're not going to drop it down but it's not going up anymore if you want to solve some problems you've got to put your hand up you've got to put some fucking effort in you've got to get off the couch and come and do some shit yourself and before i end this rant this is going to lead perfectly segue into my next point the government the dva has fucking identified that there is a problem with suicide in the veteran community it's not it's not they're not fucking ignoring it they identified it 300,000 people signed a petition saying we want a Royal Commission into DVA suicide, into veteran suicide. We got a rolling commissioner. That wasn't enough. Exactly the same thing, except it keeps going always. It's not a one-off. It's a fucking always. But then the people lobbying for it, their hero complex said, they've solved my problems. I'm now irrelevant. I need to go and shut up. Nope. I don't like it anymore. I'm going to keep fucking pushing for it. Anyway, they got 300,000 people to sign a petition to say we want to fucking investigate veteran suicide you would hope that a fucking lot of those were veterans. Otherwise, it's, a, it's an irrelevant petition. DVA spends fucking millions through open arms on developing and working with uh, is it Living Works, um, the, the ASSIST program. These programs developed in Canada and the US to be the, world, the, the gold standard in suicide prevention training. Mental health awareness, signs, symptoms, mental health awareness, and suicide prevention. So on one hand, we've got 300,000 people saying, investigate it, do something. On the other hand, DVA is like, fucking oath, we will spend millions of taxpayer money bringing these courses to Australia and offering them for free to veterans. And how many people, like this is coming from people working at Open Arms. Most of the people working at Open Arms are veterans. So when you get on the phone, you blow up at Open Arms, you're blowing up at veterans. From the for horse's mouth, they're running these courses to empty rooms. Because no one fucking wants to go. Because it's easy to sit at home and go, fuck the government, fuck DVA. It's a little bit harder, not much, but a little bit harder to register for a free course to go and learn how to identify signs and symptoms of suicide and mental health dec- decline. So that you can actually do something. So that you can see when your mate's about to kill himself and you know what to do and you know the next steps to take. But no one wants to fucking do that because it means they have to take ownership of their own space and put some fucking effort in. It's easier to sit back, call Lambie and Heston Russell and go, put me on the list because fuck the government, I want more. And that was a fucking rant, mate. But that, it, it gives me the shit. Like, Open Arms is doing almost everything that the public is demanding of them. 
an open arms for people who are watching this or listening to this that don't understand is the public facing arm of DVA. They are spending money in the right spots. They are fucking solving problems. The only issue they've got right now is everything they do has to be research based. So we can't have someone who's really good at fucking social media jumps on Channel 10 The Project and goes, come to me, I've got all the solutions, who rolls them out shooting from the hip because he fucking thought of it last night in the shower. They actually have to put this, these theories to the test. They have to fucking try and break them. They have to put them to a university study before they'll roll out products that are going to impact people's lives. So if you come up with an idea today, it might be rolled out in four years. And yes, we're going to fucking lose people. That's a hard fucking truth to swallow. Like We have lost way too many mates to suicide. We're not just saying this shit because it sounds sexy. We've, we're in this game because we've lost heaps of mates. And we're going to lose more. That's a fucking hard factor to deal with. But in order for the, the interventions that are on the table at the moment, that, that, the, um, that this commission's come up with, the points that they want to fix, that the JTA is working on, are going to solve a fuckload of problems. But it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be five years minimum. And that we've got to deal with. And now I'll shut the fuck up. No, I've got nothing Back but you, was. good things to say about open arms either. Like, um, yeah, I called them probably mid last year. Um, they had me in to just, just to talk about some things with a psych within a couple of weeks and, and a good one at that. So, yeah, I've got nothing but good things to say about open arms. Um, my issue with accountability is not for the, just for the individual, but so, you know, you join the army or defense or whatever. You got an extra water bottle out of the Q store at Singo, they'll, they'll chase you for it. But they can't tell you who was at a critical incident overseas and people are getting lifelong pensions and stuff for, for dreams and or, the, or second, third hand stories. Like, it's crazy this, this lack of accountability or communication between defence and DVA. Like, you, you should. And I'm not saying everyone had to be at a critical incident to develop some sort of. Um, condition, whether it's depression, anxiety, just a transition disorder, moving on from defence. But I think we were over-diagnosing PTSD. Like, if if you were not at a traumatic incident, tell me how it can be post-traumatic stress. Oh, fucking perfect. <laughs> Un-fucking wrap that can of worms, mate. Like, so let's I, talk about. Can we talk about the the incident, mate? Let's let's do it now. Let's. Because people are like, who the fuck is these? Are these? Who the fuck are these people talking shit? Let's talk. Let's talk. Paul Warren and 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 the incident, mate. I know we don't want to talk about it, but let's. let's can we bring it up? Let's talk about the specific day and and more more what you were going through, laying there, post that, and and how you dealt with it moving forward over the last sort of fucking eleven years. Yeah, no dramas, mate. So. I think um, I was actually thrown into the the dog squad to sort of um, we got told you know by the RSM at the time that they'd picked their alpha team and and these were the guys that were going and stuff and then next minute with four weeks notice they're like no a couple of you blokes are going into alpha company and see a lady getting deployed which is what we all wanted everyone joined not to sit on the sideline anyway so um, got thrown over with a really good team like I, I was pretty lucky the section Jusek and I went into and Sammy Fowl, obviously Ben Renato, Jimmy Thorne, like, yeah, quality team. Um, I would like to actually... You can remember that whole section? Yeah, yep. And and you can remember the whole platoon, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah I know what you're cool. getting at. Yeah, all right, mate, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, so we'd, we'd actually only... It was a bit of a crazy sort of thing for something that was meant to be well organised. We we actually met them in Kuwait and we're like, hey, we're with you. And they're like, okay, who are you? But, you know, stuff shook itself out. Um, I think I got there... That was early June, I think. Got got in. Um, it was crazy because Keats had been training for a year and, and sort of, you know, was picked and one of the best soldiers in the whole battalion, really. And then somehow I'm, I'm in again a week before him, waiting for him to get in so he can tell me what's going on because um, he knew all the information and stuff. But um, same as what you blokes went through, the early patrols, you don't really know what to expect. It's just hot and it's dusty and, you know, the locals are a bit weird and backwards and it's like going back to biblical times and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, 
yeah, you just wanted to be involved. And I think from my background, I knew I could handle stressful situations. Like that, that had been built or, or bashed into me. Like, um, and you, you, without sounding arrogant, you're keen for that to unfold just to get it out of the way, so you you know what you're dealing with, and then you can go on from there. Um, most of our stuff early on was pretty quiet. We were with um, Pete Connolly at the time. We were like the CEO's tack party. So we did a fair bit of moving around, the AO and stuff. Uh, the 17th of July, he asked us just to, to jump in with one one platoon, I think it was, just to join them and, and sort of do whatever they were doing. Um, so we got there that night, sort of patrolled in about one in the morning on the 18th of July and we weren't tasked with too much, to be honest. We were just meant to be at the back, sort of puck handling and and sort of, you know, just assisting, really, like not having a critical role in that sort of mission. Um, yeah, walked in in the dark, and it's all sorts of fun when you're with the 58, just falling over all the time because you've got no depth, depth perception and stuff like that. Um, yeah, everyone had done their job, the engineers, and put us down, and I was just sort of lying down behind a 58, um, obviously the sun had come up about then so we just got in to, to sort of, they were meant to be doing a cordon and search I think for an, uh, an OED maker or someone in that in that complex that was, was doing that sort of stuff she was all pretty quiet I remember sort of yeah, Benny having a joke something about donkeys and stuff like not long before that so just a, a typical day really and I was in that spot for I think around two hours so you're not going to lie perfectly still behind a gun for two hours um i'd move my foot and boom i triggered um an anti-purse mine um yeah launched me up into the air but i think obviously the worst part of that day that was wired up to to mortar rounds and um yeah i remember landing sort of hit the ground and just dust and my ear ringing and had no idea what was going on and we had locals around us so it didn't you know they normally avoid IED spots they're good at knowing what's going on I thought we'd been RPG'd from a different feature or something like that that was my first thought and I started to crawl a little bit and um yeah it wasn't working really well looked down and my right leg was gone so it had taken the, the anti-purse mine and taken it straight off um probably below the knee at that stage before I got into surgery um and Benny was the closest person to me. He was probably maybe two and a half, three metres away. Um, I thought, I'll get, try and get back to the closest person. Um, yeah, couldn't crawl really well, so I rolled over and I, I saw um, Thorny. He came over and tourniqueted me and stuff like that. Um, so he was conscious and sort of with it through this phase. and Because um, we all know that's not the end of it either. Once they blow you up, there's normally small arms fire or some sort of follow-up. Um, when they were with me, I was sort of asking, you know, where Benny was. He was the, the closest bloke, and, and no one would say anything to me. So I think I, I think I had a fair idea then. But near the end of it, um, obviously veins collapsed. I just lost a limb. Um, they punched one of the things into my shoulder, like trying to feed fluid into my bone marrow, which honestly hurt more than the leg. Um, it was pretty painful. So yeah, just punched one of them in and near the end when they got a chopper into me like I, I was starting to go cold and wanted to go to sleep which is probably not the best sign um, but yeah once once that chopper got there I was I don't know the Yanks are just good at their job you know I just had a you just felt safe and you, and you knew it was going to be alright then I think um, yeah because because this is so, so deep diving it bro um that feeling cold and wanting to go to sleep was there was there a, a hollywood version where you're like this is where i'm gonna fucking die like this this feels like this is what it feels like in the movies or and and you're like fuck i need to stay the fuck away because this is where i'm dying i'm dying right now yeah i was getting i was getting slapped a few times by by people to keep me awake um and it it sounds dumb and it's not it's definitely not bravado or anything like that but you, it's almost like all your adrenaline's been dumped and there's nothing left and you're just like in this weird peaceful state and you just want to go to sleep 
which is bad obviously it's bad but that's just yeah the pain had sort of the edge had come off that a little bit and obviously yeah with an adrenaline dump you just i just wanted to rack it out so um the people around me that day i'm just thankful to them like i think richo was doing was you know operating sigs and stuff like that we we're a fair way out in the Baluchi. he got a chopper he got a chopper there in 16 minutes or something ridiculous so i didn't have a long wait which is good the um, 50 you mean the fifty-seven thousand people that were there that day yeah yeah i sort of you know with all due respect to to ben i never want to you know say anything to to you know dishonor his memory or anything but the amount of people that said they were there i would have been in a u2 concert like the amount of dva claims that have gone in over that incident is ridiculous so what the fuck does it feel like um can you describe i don't want to put you in a fucking hole or a fucking drinking coma mate no nah, mate but i'm good you, you know you fucking you don't have a fucking leg mate uh are you aware of this and the, what's the pain what is going through your fucking mind like we spoke about you know the the enemy the threat picture and, and what you were doing were you were you rational were you coherent in the fact that i've just lost my fucking leg or you just didn't know what yeah i was um i, I sort of knew what was going on jusek was near me um we'd have a really good relationship he was just talking me through some stuff um I think from the minute I looked down and saw it, that's just a a memory that sort of burnt in a little bit. You're like, all right, well, that's gone. Like, check to make sure everything else is good. And I've, I've yeah, had two kids afterwards, so I'm all right. <laughs> You're talking um, about your cock, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you just, I don't know, you just do that. It's random. You're like, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, from that event, like, it, yeah, when I saw the photos, um, the tib and fib was splayed and just yeah foot and ankle was gone it was a fair bit of shrapnel up high um that had dug a, a few things out but I'm, I'm the fortunate one at the end of the day I'm, I'm sitting here getting to you know do my thing and raise two kids and that that day is not my incident that's yeah that's about a bloke that sort of gave everything yeah i uh I don't know what, 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 coming home from that and dealing with that, do you think being 27 gave you a little bit more ability to, to, to deal with, you know, a bloke who's gone through, lost his leg, you come home, or would you have fared worse being a young kid? Oh, mate, to be fair, that's, it's a, Tom I brought this up actually in a meeting like years ago and he said if this you know if you weren't not who you were but didn't have the the background you do and, and you were 27 and a little bit older he goes you wouldn't be here um, which with the statistics we talked about earlier is is, is a bit sad but it's true um, I, I'm not sure how you know the young a young boy could have um, the ability to transition through that um, and it's not the whole leg thing it's the fact that you're in an incident where one of you you know a really good mate and a good bloke got killed like that's that's hard to live with and it definitely you know gave me a lot of ups and downs and to be fair it still it still does at times well you're at a you had a traumatic experience mate i think that's a, that's actual ptsd right not my corporal yelled at me at kapuga i i just stood on an ap mine and and as a result you know we suffered a casualty and i fucking have to learn to walk again yeah that's it i think i was pretty coherent i got back and got off the, the chopper and i remember talking to doc challen a little bit and they're just about to throw me on the surgery table and yeah i think i was into him about putting a catheter in while i was still awake i'm like you're about to knock me out and what can you wait <laughs> thank you doing that right now but so i was still coherent with it um to that point I think the worst part was um, it was probably the worst day of my life just waking up from whatever surgeries they put me through and um, I sort of looked around just hoping to see him in a bed somewhere that yeah and then 
had everyone around me telling me, you know, what had happened, that Benny had been killed. But they're just, they're looking at me like, looking for how I'm going to respond. And I'm tied to all this medical shit. And I'm like, okay, you can fuck off now. <laughs> like, just give me a minute. Like, but they're all sort of watching for my reaction and I couldn't go anywhere. Um, yeah, that, that honestly, that that's probably the, the toughest thing I've been through. What? And, and the funny thing is, is that is that the, the Australian Ar- that was the toughest thing the Australian Army had been through, mate. Outside of that, they had learned and read from textbooks from Vietnam, mate. There was nobody current serving in the Australian Army that had been and suffered and learned how to deal with catastrophic injuries, amputees, and fucking casualties since, well, Somali, yet yeah, Somali Rwanda. We, you know, there was a dude that got killed. Um, the fucking army didn't know how to do it, mate. I mean, these 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 are the starts. Of, this is the stuff that you don't want to see continue to happen, right? It's the stuff that you had to deal with. Um, the real reasons for what DVA is there for is to help fucking amputees and stuff, and the and the bullshit battle from there, right? Yeah. So this this is why, like I said earlier, you want a seat inside the tent because you've you've got to. If someone's willing to offer that lived experience, and just before we left on our trip, actually, I, I was with a good mate from Touro, um, Ryan Gatley. His brother was a was down at Tudo, and he told me about Damien Tomlinson. Obviously, Damien, two thousand nine was was the start of the Defence Force learning what blast and and big injuries were. Damien had just been blown up over there in a vehicle and lost both his legs. Um, so yeah, we'd we'd lost the ability to to know how to deal with it, treat it um, physically, psychologically. We didn't have that. We were guessing, like, which it seems a little bit crazy because from now on, Massivi, that's just a risk assessment, really. Like, okay, what are the risks? Blast injuries, obviously, um, gunshot injuries. Like, yeah, it's 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 a simple risk assessment. Um, Paul de Gelder got bitten by the shark the same year, so. All three of us are, are sort of, you know, good mates and sort of, yeah, keep each other kicking along to see who was the first one up walking and all that sort of stuff. We probably fed more off each other than the, the system, like you said, was guessing, trying to get us better. I think that's... A, fuck, man, that's got to be the learning curve, right? Like, DVA there to support... And, and not make the same fucking mistakes and we're going to. And, and as much as we sit here at 30 years old, I reckon there was World War Two vets, you know, that started the Hells Angels um, that were mad dogs and now they're old 90-year-old irrelevant people. Um, what happens in 20 years' time when we go to war with X country and we've got to learn what a blast injury is again and how to how to treat with... And so... Th- and, and I don't want to politicise your incident, brother. Um... But this is my fucking argument, right? A Royal Commission fixes the problems now. Yep. And we don't fucking solve what's... This is my opinion, and I could be wrong. Somebody fucking stop me. I've read both the policies. If your fucking incident happens now, we do a Royal Commission, we say, fuck, we fucked Paul and fucking Benny and how we handled the whole thing. Let's stop doing that. Right? Let's actually just do a Royal Commission. Let's fucking figure out what we did wrong and let's move forward. And then two years time down the track, we did a Royal Commission of the bushfires. We still haven't implemented any of those things. Um, we're not going to implement any of the stuff from the Royal Commission in veteran suicide, probably. And then 20 years time, we go to another war and we've got to relearn all this fucking bullshit again. Right? Like, oh, the dude doesn't have a fucking leg. He's got to learn to walk again. How do we fucking talk to the dude? How do we... If there's a something that is consistently there to look after veterans, because war is about as constant as fucking taxes and death, then therefore the, a, a, a national commissioner that is there forever that can evolve with it. I don't know. I'm a layman, mate. I'm not a politician. It seems to me like we fucking need to do this, mate. Yeah, there's too many people speaking for us. And like Sut said earlier, because they've broadened this veteran thing, we're the minority now. So are we the most important? probably not we're the most expensive obviously i'm on a hundred and thirty thousand dollar leg like and if if that stuff's up you know I, I sort of do get looked after that way but even early on like 
they looked when I, when I got back to two HSB um, in Brisbane, like they looked through a phone book to send me to a prosthetic place. Like, which goes back to my earlier argument: did defence not do any sort of risk assessment about blast injuries, and have someone who could facilitate this? Like, and the first bloke I went and seen, he just he just shot my dreams down straight away. Like, I was in a wheelchair, and, and D came with me actually, and straight away I asked, I'm like, mate, I'm I need to run again, and I'm a bit ambitious. I hadn't even been up walking yet. But old mate's like, oh, no, you got too much damage where your pistol was up high and you're going to have dramas with a socket fitting in. I, just, I was nearly in tears, actually. Like, this bloke was bursting my dreams before I only just started working with him and just turned the wheelchair around and got out of there. Like, like no, nah, I'm going to I'm gonna work with someone a bit better than you. Like, I wasn't going to accept that you, this bloke, was going to tell me what I was capable of. That that's Nah, that's not going to fly. I fucking can't imagine. I literally, I mean, there's a difference. On, and um, so you're an above the knee amputee, which 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 has drastic implications mechanically, for you know, and physiologically. Like you have to learn to walk again. Above the knee amputees, you learn to walk again. I'm talking fucking as a layman again, mate. But below the knee, as I'm aware, is is easier to 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 learn to to walk again. Is it? Yeah, your walking and running is still driven by your knee action. Um, you know, if you're a below knee, like it's still obviously going to be difficult, and you're going to have your, your challenges and things like that. But once you go up through the knee, which is means you've got your, your full condyle or above the knee, so I had a lot of damage from shrapnel behind my knee. That I asked defence about photos and what was going on, and I didn't find out till a couple of years later when a, some random Dutch dude emailed me and said hey are these your photos i think i was in your surgery i'm like thanks mate hopefully i'm the first person you've sent them to since i'm like laid out naked on this fucking rack (laughs) i'm pretty sure yeah i own that but yeah it it, did you recognize your penis yeah (laughs) yeah i did yeah Trying to no tell leg. people it was a cold day, but it was 50 plus degrees. <laughs> no no leg, tiny dick, warlord tattoo. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a little like it, it, A, it, it makes your prosthetics expensive because you've got to come up with a mechanical function that can replicate your knee joint, which is, is difficult. Um, even now doing, you know, the CrossFit stuff we film like of. I'm lucky there's different functions on the knee, but I've got to stop and change them so it cycles and does, because your knee does so many different functions, right? And you've, you're relying on this computerized thing to sort of, to do that. And you do have to walk a little bit differently. It's probably more driven by your hip and um, hip flexor and glutes and stuff like that. So yeah, learning to walk was, yeah, interesting. And the bloke they did send me to, he was still making the old school sockets out of like, um, Fiberglass, like a fucking pirate. Yeah, so it's still Vietnam technology when we're, you know, when it's two thousand and nine. So, and do you know what? Unless, if you're not an amputee, you probably know fuck all about amputees. So until it happens to you, I don't know good from bad. I'm like, they just give you this thing, and you're like, all right, I'll try it on. And I think early on, I was probably. I'm like, I must be doing something wrong. Like, this is heavy and I can only walk around a few hours a day, but it was just sort of outdated technology. You can have the best leg, but until you've got, you know, a really good socket. Um, and Jens um, Borfelt, he's the best in the country. He does a lot of Curtis's Paralympic stuff, does De Gelder's leg, my leg. I think he does Damien Tomlinson's as well. He, he got, like, full sockets down to you know three or four hundred grams with carbon fiber so made your life a lot easier yeah i mean it's one of the one of the benefits of war is that when they they realize that there is a problem with something and they solve it war's got the budget america normally he's got the military budget to solve things mate like you look at pre going into afghan and iraq it was all old fucking skin colored plastic things um they were more worried about cosmetic image than function. Trying to make a hand that looks like a hand or a foot that looks like a foot. It's like, these days, it's like, no, give me something that I can fucking operate on. I don't give a fuck if it looks black and metallic. 
but they've come a long way since since the nineties. Yeah, you're exactly right. I've got no doubt that we can put this purely on pretty much American numbers. I think of amputees where they went. Nah, I'm not. I'm not your sixty year old person with diabetes. I don't want to just walk around and sweep the house. I want to get out. I want to run. I want to do this. I want to. I want to do CrossFit stuff. I want to. I want to work. Like we, we've come to this period where everyone that got injured from defence, oh yeah, here's your pension, sit at home. And we all know that's no good for any of us. Like, I want to work. I want to function. I want to do all this stuff. But yeah, I've got no doubt that's come from this that period of war where so many Americans and and Brits, you know, lost their legs and and Germany. You know, Otto Bock in Germany went, we need to come up with something better. Fucking Germans, mate. Best they're make, they're pretty they, they're they're pretty. they take over. <laughs> now the robot army's coming. <laughs> mate, that is a fucking story. Um, so how, without regressing too much, how, did it, did you, did it, how long did it take you before, I mean, I'm assuming it's a, it's a forever ongoing journey, but how long did it take you from getting blown up to being at a point where you were capable of going about your day mentally. I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about mentally. How long were you in a fucking hole for? Yeah, it's a fair question. And I, for me, I think the physical had an effect on the mental, obviously. Like any, I think, you know, you see it in units, anyone that does a, a knee or an ankle, if it's a long recovery, they start to get depressed and they get, you know, regress a little bit. So the two are definitely attached, but for me, I had goals when I was in hospital, and Dee and I have spoken about this because she was with me the whole time. Like, um, I, I seemed to be good, but when I got home, it's when it like, all right, what is life about now? And on every morning, you drag this big heavy leg on, and straight away it'd remind me of of, of Benny and what had happened. Um, I got to a point where I obviously wasn't real happy and, and, and you know, Dee was pretty young then. She's only about 25, so she it's not like she had a whole lot of experience about this. We've started, you know, talking about this lately. Um, I I overdosed. I took a whole heap of pain meds and, and yeah, I, I don't think it was intentional, but I was just, I, I don't know. I couldn't speak with too much clarity. Um, just the amount of pain meds I had to, to throw in to walk around on this cut bone that wasn't working on a, a decent leg. And obviously that affects you mentally as well. So I think I started to come good around August 2010 because um, that's when my daughter was born. And that, that made me like snap out of it mentally. I'm like, nah, this is not all about me anymore. And yeah, she's not going to see dad feeling sorry for herself. So that, that was literally the turning point for me so just over 12 months i think mate i fucking love that the i remember um when when we when we were setting up swiss eight and, and obviously you were coming on as an ambassador and you, you sent me through a bunch of photos and there's uh you you in the military you doing a bunch of stuff a few different photos with invictus all, all the all the glory ones that the newspapers want to put up and there was one of you and your daughter and i'm like Mate, well, I, can, I can only check one up as your bio photo. What one do you want? And you know, fucking straight away, mate. Like the one with my daughter. That was the game changer. I'm like, fuck. I mean, that that breaks hearts, mate. It was good. I loved it. Yeah, I appreciate that, mate. I think it still is, and it part of. I don't know. It's part of what Max was talking about. For what what drives you to join the army? And what, we all knew we were getting deployed, and we were going to go to the Middle East at some point. And then it's post 9/11, so shit things were happening in the world, and. I, the big thing when you, when you get to hold this this person that's yours, like I went so you didn't have to. Like that that's that's my whole reason. I think like I'd rather go and, and put myself in that position so my kids get to still not sold on the world. My kids are going to be left with with all this the stuff we've been talking about earlier. But that that's a massive reason you you'll put yourself in harm's way so your kids don't have to to do that. Hundred percent, mate. 100%. So, so now, now the backstory is there, right? And and uh, I'll bring up some counter arguments that that I don't think there is. I mean, our audience is fucking super loyal. They they fucking love it, mate. It's it's blowing up. But um, now the backstory is there. I want to bring up uh, the the probably ten years too late Purple Heart. Um, 
And well, mouth guards in. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, we we spoke about Purple Heart probably pro, pre pre Afghan. We're like, why the fuck don't we have a Purple Heart? Um, it was probably pre pre Iraq two thousand seven. We're like, we should probably have a fucking Purple Heart in the shrine, aren't we? And then you know, his old old blokes like, what you want to get a medal for getting fucking shot, like. And we're like, yeah, nah, fair call, cool, righto, you know. Because you're a young 17-year-old kid, you're like, yeah, whatever. You know, you have no context to what a natural injury is. And nor did they because they were in a peacetime army. Now we're 10 years post the incidents and, and, and probably when, when's the last kinetic fighting that happened in in Afghan? 2013? I don't I think, know. I think 2014 for us, wasn't it? 14, yeah. 14? So seven years ago now. So now we want a purple heart, bro. Why? Why now? So here's my issue with it. Um, going to Orlando in 2016, I cap- was lucky. I think it was a Paralympic year for Curtis to let someone else be captain because I'm not as handsome as him. They're, they're like, let me have the job just to, to keep him fit for Paralympics. Um, and it was amazing. Like, I got to speak at a mental health symposium with George Bush and Prince Harry that went live on ESPN and they really revere and, you know, a lot of the other countries did Invictus so much more legitimate than we did. Um, there was female amputees, you know. In some events, we look like we're taking the piss when half your wheelchair basketball team gets out, gets up out of chairs and walks off after the games and there's no legs on the other team. Like, that goes back to broadening <laughs> that thing and, and making it less legitimate, like... We, we were that team, unfortunately, because we tried to appease everyone and we couldn't say no. And talking to, to a lot of the American blokes, and some of them had Purple Heart caps and stuff like that, and you find out about the history of it, where it came from, that initially it was a piece of gold wrapped in purple cloth that was presented to you or your family if it's obviously the person that went to war back then was, was your breadwinner, right? They're, they're your person for looking after your family. So the gold was like whether they died or been injured was like a, a thing to, um, you know, replicate or make up for, for them not being able to provide anymore. It was sort of pretty revered and still is to this day. When you see it, it's a powerful image because there's a lot of tradition and stuff behind it. I hope that history is true, actually. Otherwise, I've been sold up the stream by... Nah, no, as long as you go, this mate. podcast, mate. As long actually, as you, as long Keegan, as you say before, you're me. not off the hook, mate. What, the veterinarian, where did it come from? <laughs> Yeah, oh, actually, okay. I actually got it up. So, veterinarian, you're right. It was they were Roman soldiers that were excused from regular duty, so they would look after the horses. But it wasn't just because they were injured. It could be because they had other commitments, like uh, work and stuff, like other work, so like part timers, I guess. Oh, yeah, reservist. So veterinarian, reservist, fucker. But it wasn't the that. It's not where the word came from. The word was vet in Rome meant like uh, lame horse. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of similar to to vet now. Pretty similar. <laughs> Used to be good. Now lays around all the time. <laughs> um, right. So so the purple heart, mate. Uh, Talk in its to inception. Americans yep. face to face about it. The conditions, how it's written up, is very is very stringent. There's no left and right. We've shown through Invictus Games. We can't say no. We like to appease everyone. Everyone. Everyone gets a turn. Everyone's. You know, little things like that. So what's it going to turn into? I, I even saw a guy over there on our team, unfortunately, that um, I'll be honest, I, I rang management and tried to get him not on the team because he didn't even have the respect of his battalion. So those guys were ringing me, kicking up, going, this bloke never finished a bush X, always got a sore back, and now he's powerlifting in the Australian Invictus team. What are you doing? And I'm like, all right, I'm... I went to management and was told to sort of keep quiet and, and stuff like that. Um, but to me, that's, it, you know, it's it's not legitimate. You, can, you can't put someone on that stage that doesn't even have the respect of your unit. And that's the one thing I do miss about a battalion is you, your whole reputation is, it's it's built on your performance. You know, you can you can be gay, you can be black, you, you know, no one's going to throw shade at you for too much stuff if you if you do your job and you're good at it. Like, I, I miss that. It doesn't matter, you know, what your personal interests or anything like that are. You, performance was, yeah, what built your reputation. Um, and to see this guy over there, sort of, he must have let 
got photos with one of the Yanks that had a purple hard hat and he put it on. It's like, oh, I can't explain that. It just it didn't seem right to me. And the other thing that sits with me... He got presented a hard hat and he, and he actually put it on. Oh, he just chucked it on, I think, just messing around. So, yeah, there's a lot of storytelling going on with how people had got there from our team to the other teams and just little things like that. So, um, once again, they needed to make the criteria like with the Purple Heart, a whole lot more legitimate. Here's my issue with this. So 2009, um, like you said, a lot of the fighting was probably done by 2014. If you're going to replicate the Purple Heart criteria, then it's got to be, um, you know, a a severity of injury in defense of America or her enemies or something like that, I think it states. So it's combat injuries. I, I don't think we're going to be strong enough to say no or have that strict criteria because we're we're a country that doesn't like to offend people or say no. Um, and the second thing is, why now? So it, it almost makes me angry, actually. Like, um, and I'll, I'll speak from the heart a little bit. Like, the besides being blown up, probably one of the hardest things that um, for me is I went through a divorce at the end of last year. Um, and Dee did put a lot aside for me when I was going through my rehabilitation. She was with me, doctor's appointments, learning how to walk, all that stuff. And now, all of a sudden, 10 or 11 years later, you want to recognise that, like, that that I'm injured, and I almost feel it's a slap in the face for the people that were with us as well, like, and now you want to drag this up 10 10 years later when a lot of people have probably moved on with their lives and, and are reasonably successful, and you want to go, hey, remember that time where you lost a mate and you got shot and blown up? Like, we're going to give you a medal now. Why now? What's what's driving it? And with how politicised everything's been, it, it doesn't feel legitimate. It's There's a political angle. There's If you wanted to recognise it, recognise it when people get off the plane missing limbs. Recognise their families when they're like, people have gone through stressful times and, and wives and partners and, and everyone else goes for that ride with you like it it almost feels like a slap in the face to do it 10 years later because this is the fucking kicker right um mental health this fuck mental health is this place where everyone wants to play around in but when you're talking about physical injuries as 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 a result of direct enemy action then you're compartmentalizing people, right? Uh, and we don't like to do that. We don't like to... We're trying to grey the whole world out. Um, we know how it's going to fucking end up. You know, that's what you're worried about, right? So if I, if, if I could promise you as the Prime Minister of Australia and say, hey, look, the only people that are going to get a Purple Heart is, a, is from a direct result of enemy action, like near on like physically you either get shot blown up you stand on a mine you fucking um whatever it is direct result of enemy action it's not um would you be more receptive of it and you know if there's no time frame involved in it i get the time frame piece and we know why the time frame piece we're trying to we're trying to um uh, appease a, a six hundred thousand veterans. That's quite a out of a, a out of a country of twenty three million. Um, that's fucking a good percentage. Um, let's give them all another medal before tax before the next election. That'll get some fucking votes. Because who's gonna get a who's gonna get a purple heart? Well, um, which is the next fucking question. I want to I want to change things too. Um, if you're if you put a claim in from DVA from being overseas, are you then not a, a casualty of war? Uh, so if you put in a claim for PTSD or whatever, you're a casualty of war in some 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 respects. You've been injured or wounded through war. That means that the Taliban get kill counts and get fucking they get more count they get more runs on the board right. Yeah, we only killed fucking 43 Australians, but we put 400,000 Australians on a pension, which costs them fucking 
seven eighty thousand dollars a year for the rest of their life. Mate, like. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think the Taliban's got access to our DVA records. You we you would the, hope. You can do the math. What? They can do it on. They can do it on what? Instagram or Jackie Lambie's page. My pension's forty two, by the way. So someone's doing well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the pension <laughs> is, mate. Um, um, <laughs> you you've answered in that what you just proposed or asked of me it, it could cover so many of our issues in this space because you said if the pm spoke to you or or consulted you fucking consult us actually get us in a room like but the problem is so this is the we problem don't need to spend hundreds of millions on a royal commission get us in a room use the lived experience yes i have this 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 and this um, you know the the people. With the problem is with minorities, mate, and that is honestly a god's honest. I think uh, he's like fuck. I've got to look after the veterans, but we, we, no. To be so, to be fair, um, there there is when 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 things do happen, and, and um, I mean, was it you? Probably one of the blokes that you you would go, yeah, bring the dude to the conversation. Um, the this new rolling commissioner is going around the country hosting fucking round table discussions now the 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 big issue as i mean without getting too deep into the the formation of the pyramid of top down approaches and how they don't work because they don't know who to speak to and if you put a general in a room and you go and the general goes bring me the the 10 most influential people and he says it to his fucking um ceo half bird colonel and the CEO Harper Colonel's going to go and grab all the subbies and the fucking captains, right? When re- the reality is you want to have a room full of diggers. But if a general's doing a tour around the country or this rolling commissioner doing a tour around the country going, all right, I'm going to host these round tables and find out what the fucking word on the street is, how is she organising her, her group of diggers to, to give her the word on the street? Most boy, most of the younger generation don't even know this this is happening. No one knows she's on a, on a world tour. Um so that's that's the problem there is there is communication disconnect but where's where do you draw the line like i don't want to fucking know mate I don't, i'm running swiss eight definitely want to know what's going on with government politics in the dva space but as a as a young digger when I, as a young veteran when i got out i don't want to know the fucking ins and outs of every politician doing the rounds around australia running whatever the fuck they're doing i just don't care i got oh, i'd rather just live my life to be honest um but the, the problem you've got is when people like our mate um, was going or was asked yesterday in his forum what would you do differently he's like I'd go and talk to the people and then 15 minutes later he's like don't we need a royal commission and then 15 minutes after that he's like this rolling commission is going around giving talks uh, hosting round, round tables I'm like that's exactly what what you said you want to do is what she's doing but the problem is it's the people invited to the round table conversations that's I think the piece that needs to change and again, I don't like blowing smoke up, Tomo, but he's a fucking digger, and he's in the he's in Parliament, and he's bringing diggers to the table, and that's the only way I think we move forward is to get people from the other side of the silver spoon, the ones that never got to see it, touch it, or eat from it, put them in a room and see what they got to say. Yeah, there's too many people in this space that are not in it for the right reasons. Wholly and solely, I'd like some of these systems to be reformed like we said to look after the next generation of guys and girls that are going to go overseas and hopefully they're not looking through phone books finding them limbs like that is 100 mate it's terrible but it's amazing so dva's thing should be let's not make the same mistakes we've made exactly for the next generation that's with mental that's with mental health as well like I, when i first got diagnosed honestly i struggled that someone was sitting there telling me I had something um, wrong with me in that capacity. Like I, I had that was traumatic in itself for me. I'm like, I thought I had my my resilience to a level. Used to turn up and fight strangers for money, like it was some sort of, you know, some sort of nutcase, I guess, or had had some sort of weird thing going on. I, I thought I could handle nearly everything, but that for me was was sort of a dark time and and coming to terms with that, and then moving forward on the way you know defense treated that um i'm thankful for andrew hocking the ceo we had at the time that came in after pete Connolly. um when he first met me he came into a room at 2hsb and he just i hadn't shaved i hadn't done anything like that for ages like 
Um, he sat with me for about three hours and just talked with me, like, didn't talk down to me, talked to me, and we're still friends to this day. Like, um, he put things in place as an individual and someone and showed real leadership in this space when it came to mental health. He went, well, you report to, he put Patchy in charge of me or someone that knew a little bit about it and had a bit of a background and insight. He goes, well, you, you just stay over there and you work with that and you, you sort of keep going that way rather than a system that was failing us. Like, um, they were guessing on how to treat us. Like, and you know what? Some people need to take medication. Some people don't. Like, um, it, it's horses for courses as well. It's not one one size fits all. So we need, obviously, more research into that space. But going back to the original point, there's too many people in this space that are in it for their next promotion for a political agenda or election rather than be the Tomos and just he's got it got to his position and he's still for the for the people like for us um, to bring a bit of truth to the space and half of these people that are going to turn up to these round tables they've got their own agendas um, I've seen it they're chasing an OAM or some sort of medal I couldn't care less about that I just want the system to be reformed so we look after people a bit better um, and that in, that's inclusive of families I think ESOs a lot of them take a hell of a lot of money I, I worked for an ESO at one point um, and for me it was a struggle like I left you know who was going to hire a bloke who just left defence as an above knee amputee um, had written a book about mentally comparing a physical injury to psychological hoping that other blokes would read that and come forward uh, that, that was really the main aspect of that and Got a job on a refugee camp on Nauru, which is probably the worst place for me. Like, yeah, go and hang out with the Packies and Afghans. Like, pretty sure I've played this game. <laughs> Last time we didn't real well. Nah, but it was a job and I, I, I just wanted to, like, comes back to family. I wanted my kids to see me getting out working. I wanted to support my wife and my kids. Um, finally got a job with, with mates and mates here in town and they spend a lot of money, um, Queensland RSL, sort of having those centres open. And I did get to get a few boys in for, for free psych and, and stuff like that when they were at that point where they needed to unload something. So there are some positives there. But they just set it up wrong because they weren't... They didn't engage with us again. It's It was set up wrong because they brought in business people or people to tell us what we want. Um, 8.30 to 4.30 were the opening hours. I'm like, all right, sweet. So you've just ruled out every person that's left defence and is working. So, of course, you know, it was set up for contemporary, I sort of hate that word, but the younger veterans, unless you're TPI, you're at work. So we didn't get the younger veterans. We got the older ones that are, it just, the whole thing was just set up poorly and designed poorly because they did not consult with us. I right. think, so, <laughs> so what's your prediction what like what, what what are you predicting for the purple heart? Are we going to get are we going to Australian equivalent, and who is it going to go to? In the words of Paul Warren, I think they'll appease everyone, and it won't be as strict or as stringent as a purple heart. So it'll be a watered down version that is all about votes, like or is all about like I said. Who the strange thing for me is is who's driving this? Like is it is it parents? Is it politicians is it you know I've, I'm I'm good with walking on a prosthetic now if you wanted to recognise this and uh, my ex-wife sacrifices and all the other partners you should have done this 10 years ago when it happened why is it important now it'll be a watered down version to appease people I think that's, so everyone's, that, that's sad that's really sad absolutely but it has yeah. no significance whatsoever if you give, if the model the original model come I mean came from from trying to give them financial um compensation i guess to people who can't work anymore dva is doing a pretty good job of that filling people's bank accounts with cash um something to pin on your chest fuck me dead i don't get it i mean they even they that veteran pin i don't I, that baffles me mate there's enough shit going on your chest on anzac day um What's the point? The mother's, the mother's badge is one. Uh, Huggo and I asked the PM on Paul Murray one night. And obviously, I think you were there, Max. Like, yeah, yep. That's something significant. You know, if you've lost a child, 
you know, um, like Vicky, Maddie Lambert's mum, like they should 100% be recognised. You want to do something positive in the space, recognise the 43 mothers and, and people like that um, straight away. I, I've got I've got a really weird relationship with my medals and I hardly ever wear them, even on Anzac Day. I think I've got a reminder, you know, most days when I get up, like of, of my deployment and stuff like that. Like, See, that's the difference, man. I think that's what it is. Uh, complacency and the ability to forget. I get to wake up in the morning and some days I'm super hungover and some days I'm really busy with work. Some, give, days, give I'm not really, some days I'm not really busy with work. <laughs> some days I'm really performing. Uh, but my, moon, my, my mindset can change directly proportionate to, to my life circumstances. Yours is anchored to it. Yours is... I'm going to go and get up and take a piss in the night. I just walk up and go, fuck, I'm sh- so shit, I'm awake. I'm going to go take a piss. You're hopping to the toilet going, I remember, I remember. Do you, you know what I mean? <laughs> that is the fucking difference. And I think that's what a Purple Heart is. And, and I don't, yeah. I think um, we all know that, that Australia is a society based on, on a welfare system. If you give a Purple Heart, it needs to be very fucking specific. On, on exactly what they get them for. And it's that is be, a direct result of enemy action uh, with physical... It's got to be physical, man. But it, it can't be... It can't be... I get it, man. I saw some of the... Docu- What's that documentary you watched at Readers? The the movie Outpost. That's a movie, mate. It's not a doco. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's fucking... It, it was real. It was a true story. <laughs> they were uh, the like- Outpost... Those fucking Fuck dudes, if they've got PTSD, they got fucking. They were like in a gunfight, like, we're probably going to die today. And that was 365 days of the year. Like, it wasn't like, yeah, this is. So you get into, a, you get into your first fist fight against a 30 year old dude, you're like, yeah, I'm a fucking mad cunt. Um, I guess at the end state of all that, uh, you sort of learn to live with the fact that you're going to go play chess with a human being. And I think Americans in that. Right? particular outpost and, and World War Two veterans, some dudes in Vietnam went and learnt to play chess with their own mortality and, and what was going to happen to them. Uh, yeah, for sure. I don't think I've ever had too much faith in the honours and award system. And, and here's a funny one for you. So I finally got back to work like back into 2009 or 2000, early 2010 and they, they put me in ops with Yogi and he was sort of looking after me. And on my PM keys, this thing came up and was like, I, I don't know what this is. Probably taking too many endone that day. So, I, um, you know, bronze commendation was there. And apparently the section, our section got them for obviously what had happened. And then about a week later, it's gone. And I'm like, all right. And then someone came to me and said, listen, we made a mistake. You know, your section got it, but you didn't get it because you were the injured guy. <laughs> so they, they put one... You know what? It's the opposite purple heart. (laughs) They they put it. This is how much like I make of the honors and awards, particularly like I didn't care. I was more angry that the blokes that went through that, like, only received a bronze commendation when we know people got a whole lot more for a whole lot less. Gold commendations and above (laughs) a bronze one. Like the the boys should have got, you know, a little bit more than that for what they dealt with that day. Um, kept me alive had to hold that ground after I'd been well after I'd been chopped out and still carried on with the next seven months of the deployment yeah so um, they deserve commendations more than that. are direct this is the thing but so commendations I, I think you, in order to get a bronze commendation it's CO level right so CO gives you a bronze commendation a silver commendation the brigadier will give you a silver commendation has to go to a brigadier um, and then I think it's Someone, someone's going to jump on and be like, nah, that's fucking wrong. But the levels are, I'm pretty sure it's CO, Brigadier, and, and Army, right? So Division. So they're the people that have to. So the fact that you got a bronze commendation was the CO was like, these cunts went through some shit on my watch, and they should get a bronze commendation. The fact that it wasn't silver or gold means that nobody gave a fucking shit, mate. Means Above that the, Hawks. Above was hocks, it ho- mate. Was it was it hocking when the it would have been hocking. Blown out? Was it was, was it still? No, it would have um, been Pete Connolly. Connolly. Yeah. Well, Connolly hocks. or hocks, mate. Yeah. Hocks mate. took over. Started twenty ten. I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. Tell you what, man, like shifting gears, they were fucking two pretty good CEOs to have overseas. Solid dudes. So, mate, the, the year when we got, the way Hocking brought us back from overseas was about as fucking good as you can get. He did not give a fuck what was supposed to happen. He was like, this is this is how you run a battalion that's just come back from Afghan. I'm like, fuck, he did well. And he's still a good about- friend to this day. Like, you, you talk about the, you know, someone, he's a two star now, obviously. He invited mm. Tomo and I to um, when he was getting promoted. Look, you've invited two diggers down, you know, to see a two-star promotion. But the biggest thing is, he's, you know, he owes he owes me nothing. Like, I was just a digger that got wounded. Like, and he he hadn't we even taken over leg, the leg, then. leg would be a good start, mate. Mate, nah. we're gonna have to reach back out. We Max sent me. He wrote a paper on on the ESO space a couple of years ago. I, Max I sent it to me the other day, reading through it. Ganging up on the problem, mate. Yeah, it's he good. fucking. I mean, it's almost like prophetic. Is that a is that a word? Like to be, it was. It's, it's almost profound. A prophecy, yeah, like, pro, yeah. Well, mate, the, he he saw what was what needed to happen before it needed to happen, and he's like, "This is what's going to happen. This is what needs to happen. Start fucking changing." And no one listened to it. Yet, I mean, hopefully they are. It was all. I'm like, it fits exactly with the model we built conveniently, but um. We've got to we've got to touch base with him because we I, I built I mean we, we started putting ideas around because what that's what the boys were, were chasing and, and we were like talking about issues that needed to be fucking raised. Hawks had raised them a couple of years ago, twenty seventeen. Yeah, mm. I hope he's CDF because he's a different type of leader. He's not, um, and obviously you mean he's an actual leader. Actual. Oh, is it? He cares about people, not just. Um, so the the crazy thing, and this is how much he cares, like. When I was being interviewed with Rymatel after they tried to kill me in Chile on that expedition, um, he literally flew from Canberra to Melbourne and came with me to my job interview. So it doesn't hurt when you've got like a brigadier that's going to sit in like and actually give you, you know, a vote of confidence and, and that sort of stuff. Like, oh, I can't thank him enough for, for that. Um, mm. And I think that trend, that's another transition for me. Like, I, I didn't feel like. I belonged in that corporate world, especially walking into a big company like Rheinmetall. Um, and he, you know, he sort of took me aside and he goes, "Look, when when have you ever had growth without being uncomfortable? Whether you're fighting, whether you're in the army, like he's like, you'll be all right." Like, and it, yeah, he just he just sort of made you feel, um, yeah, a little bit at ease, which is once again just leadership one hundred and one, I think. Um, and after that, because of the gaps we see, we're sort of able to design and implement that pr- the, the program that won the Prime Minister's Veteran Employment Awards. Like, this is a gap that if you ask us, we'll tell you where it is. Like, and now companies are looking at bringing veterans in on job placements, whether they're injured, whether they have PTSD. It's, it's not a hindrance anymore. It's, it's come in and we'll see what you're capable of and what you can do. And, you know... The program at Rymatel was like it works pretty well. We've picked up another amputee and another few guys that were a bit lost and didn't know what to do after service. And there's some some female veterans in there as well. So it's definitely a gap employment. So right, let, let's just let's just consolidate most of this. Um, uh, fighting a seventeen a thirty year when you're seventeen, Australasian kickboxing champion joins the army, goes overseas above the knee amputee, goes through some traumatic stuff. Goes, you know what? Fuck it. I'm not quite dead yet. Um, I'll, I want to go and work for Ryan Mattel, defense industry, and then I'm going to go up Chile, which is the, which was, which is a whole event in itself, right? Yeah, it was a bit crazy. I just come off the two Invictus Games, and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm done with this, and I may have butted heads with a few people on the way out because it was getting less legitimate that I felt, and I was just trying to appease everyone. Um, and I'd sort of been twice and I was a bit over it and managed to run again. Like, um, didn't run very well, but still ran. Um, and I thought, went back to sort of, I was working at Mates for Mates then and I was a little bit over that as well. Like, because it's not a good news space. If you're in the veteran space, you're very rarely getting people ringing you going, DVA were awesome today. And they have been on, on heaps of occasions. You, you just, you're not getting the good news. The veteran space is, is very rarely about good news. So I was keen to sort of move out of there. And um, Ryan Mattel approached me with this event in um, Chile in South America. 
they wanted to drive two vehicles to the highest drivable point in the world, which is the Andes Atacama. So the yeah the driest desert on the planet. And yeah, altitude sickness, minus 30 degrees, 100k an hour winds, like what could go wrong? Yeah, it's a crazy trip, but some good people. And I went with a UK veteran as well. Uh, yeah, um, Chris, he'd, um, he'd broken his back in Iraq. Something had failed when they were, yeah, they were obviously doing some roping stuff and he hit the ground pretty hard and broke his back. So fortunate enough to meet, yeah, Chris Bailey and, and some good people like that and get to experience South America. And um, once I sat down with one of the executives from Rymatel and, and he'd sort of asked me about how it was moving on getting a job and I told him I'd sent my CV out about 50, 60 times and just got nothing back. He, he basically let me have the, the reins to design and implement their own veteran program to help people out in a similar boat. So i um, pretty thankful for him. Um, ben Hudson, his name is. He's gone on to BAE now, but um, yeah, definitely thankful. He, he gave me the reins to sort of come in and, and build that. And then win the Veteran Employment Awards. Yeah, lucky enough to get that last year. And I think we went about it in a really different way. Like, you know, if you grab a, a captain or a major that's transitioning out of defence, that's got a skill set and probably university education, it's a transition. It's not, it's not that hard to get them into a role that they can do, right? But the lowest common denominator is the digger, probably combat cause, no skill set. What do we do with them? We, you know, and and could be injured as well. Like I piloted the program with one of my mates, um, BJ. He's, a, he's an above knee amputee as well. He's X two four. So I just went. We're going to go after what's perceived as a complex case. Show that these people belong in the workplace if they've got that drive and desire to be there. And yeah, the company picked him up. And he works in procurement now, so does a lot of contract management and that sort of stuff. Is that a direct result? Like, is is it because you are so th- th- there's a drive to succeed as an amputee that some people who don't have to, they're just like, well, I'm just going to get a pension. I don't really give a fuck. But there's an internal drive as an amputee to be like, I'm fucking not going to fail. I don't, I don't think so, mate. I think you might be overplaying it there a little bit. Like, I, I, I appreciate it, and I get what you're saying. I think this is this is about our this space, and we can come up with solutions. For me, that was, you know, I'm I'm not that I'm not a genius on a computer or design programs or anything like that. But it was gaps and stuff that we were missing, and to help me with that transition, all I wanted was a company to bring me in and engage with me even on a work trial and I would have showed them that I was, you know, worth something. Um, in regards to the amputee thing, I think, you know, you have days where if you're angry, you're angry. If you're tired, you're tired. If you're over it, you're over it, whether you're an amputee or not. So you just, you know, we all, we all deal with stuff in our own, own way, but 10 or 11 years later, yeah, in, in long pants, mate, most people know and I don't give them a reason to know. <laughs> right, mate. Um, so, uh, outside of of the, the fucking repertoire of what you've done, writing a book and moving forward, mate. Um, I I think we've managed to actually finally, and we could keep talking for another ninety minutes, I reckon, to encapsulate Paul Warren, um, mate. I just want to say thanks for for fucking being an ambassador and for being a bastion for what even for using the army's term of what right looks like and giving people context maybe to the future debate of what the purple heart would be or should be mate it was great seeing you on the show and and um we'll put your book up in the uh comments and the social posts but uh fuck it's always good to have you mate thanks for coming on Oh, thanks boys happy to be on I appreciate it and your time and hopefully they engage us and we can come up with some of these solutions soon because they are there